Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. Part One, Chapter Ten. The Man of the Waters. It was the ship's commander who had just spoken. At these words, Ned Lang stood up quickly. Nearly strangled, the steward staggered out at a signal from his superior. But such was the commander's authority aboard his vessel, not one gesture gave away the resentment that this man must have felt toward the Canadian. In silence, we waited for the outcome of this scene. Conseil, in spite of himself, seemed almost fascinated. I was stunned. Arms crossed, leaning against a corner of the table, the commander studied us with great care. Was he reluctant to speak further? Did he regret those words he had just pronounced in French? You would have thought so. After a few moments of silence, which none of us would have dreamed of interrupting, Gentlemen, he said in a calm, penetrating voice, I speak French, English, German, and Latin with equal fluency. Hence, I could have answered you as early as our initial interview, but first, I wanted to make your acquaintance and then think things over. Your four versions of the same narrative, perfectly consistent by and large, established your personal identities for me. I now know that sheer chance has placed in my presence Professor Pierre Aronnax, specialist in natural history at the Paris Museum, and entrusted with a scientific mission aboard. His manservant, Conseil, and Ned Land are pooner of Canadian origin aboard the Abraham Lincoln, a frigate in the National Navy of the United States of America. I bowed in agreement. The commander hadn't put a question to me, so no answer was called for. This man expressed himself with perfect ease and without a trace of an accent. His phrasing was clear, his words well chosen, his facility in elocution remarkable, and yet to me he didn't have the feel of a fellow countryman. He went on with the conversation as follows. No doubt, sir, you felt that I waited rather too long before paying you this second visit. After discovering your identities, I wanted to weigh carefully what policy to pursue towards you. I had great difficulty deciding. Some extremely inconvenient circumstances have brought you into the presence of a man who has cut himself off from humanity. Your coming has disrupted my whole existence. Unintentionally, I said. Unintentionally, the stranger replied, raising his voice a little. Was it unintentionally that the Abraham Lincoln hunted me on every sea? Was it unintentionally that you travelled aboard that frigate? Was it unintentionally that your shells bounced off my ship's hull? Was it unintentionally that Mr. Ned Land hit me with his harpoon? I detected a controlled irritation in these words, but there was a perfectly natural reply to these charges, and I made it. Sir, I said, you're surely unaware of the discussions that have taken place in Europe and America with yourself as the subject. You don't realize that various accidents caused by collisions with your underwater machine have aroused public passions on those two continents. I'll spare you the innumerable hypotheses with which we've tried to explain this inexplicable phenomenon, whose secret is yours alone, but please understand that the Abraham Lincoln chased you over the Pacific high seas in the belief it was hunting some powerful marine monster which had to be purged from the ocean at all cost. A half-smile curled the commander's lips. Then, in a calmer tone, "'Professor Aronnax,' he replied, "'do you dare claim that your frigate wouldn't have chased and cannonaded an underwater boat as readily as a monster?' This question baffled me, since Commander Farragut would certainly have shown no such hesitation. He would have seen to it as his sworn duty to destroy a contrivance of this kind just as promptly as a gigantic narwhale. "'So you understand, sir,' the stranger went on, "'that I have a right to treat you as my enemy.' I kept quiet with good reason. What was the use of debating such a proposition when superior force can wipe out the best arguments? "'It took me a while to decide,' the commander went on. "'Nothing obliged me to grant you hospitality. If I were to part company with you, I'd have no personal interest in ever seeing you again. I could put you back on the platform of this ship that has served as your refuge. I could sink under the sea, and I could forget you ever existed.' "'Wouldn't that be my right?' "'Perhaps it would be the right of a savage,' I replied, "'but not that of a civilized man.' "'Professor,' the commander replied swiftly, "'I'm not what you term a civilized man. "'I've severed all ties with society "'for reasons that I alone have the right to appreciate. "'Therefore, 
I obey none of its regulations, and I insist that you never invoke them in front of me.' This was plain speaking. A flash of anger and scorn lit up the stranger's eyes, and I glimpsed a fearsome past in this man's life. Not only had he placed himself beyond human laws, he had rendered himself independent, out of all reach, free, in the strictest sense of the word. For who would dare chase him to the depths of the sea when he thwarted all attacks on the surface? What ship could withstand a collision with his underwater monitor? What armor plate, no matter how heavy, could bear the thrusts of his spur? No man among men could call him to account for his actions. God, if he believed in him, his conscience, if he had one, these were the only judges to whom he was answerable. These thoughts swiftly crossed my mind while this strange individual fell silent, like someone completely self-absorbed. I regarded him with a mixture of fear and fascination, in the same way, no doubt, that Oedipus regarded the Sphinx. After a fairly long silence, the commander went on with our conversation. "'So I had difficulty deciding,' he said. "'But I concluded that my personal interests could be reconciled with that natural compassion to which every human being has a right. Since fate has brought you here, you'll stay aboard my vessel. You'll be free here, and in exchange for that freedom, moreover, totally related to it, I'll lay on you just one condition. Your word that you'll submit to it will be sufficient.' "'Go on, sir,' I replied. I assume this condition is one an honest man can accept? Yes, sir. Just this. It's possible that certain unforeseen events may force me to confine you to your cabins for some hours, or even for some days, as the case may be. Since I prefer never to use violence, I expect from you, in such a case, even more than in any other, your unquestioning obedience. By acting in this way, I shield you from complicity, I absolve you of all responsibility, since I myself make it impossible for you to see what you aren't meant to see. Do you accept this condition? So things happened on board that were quite odd, to say the least, things never to be seen by people not placing themselves beyond society's laws. Among all the surprises the future had in store for me, this would not be the mildest. We accept, I replied, only I'll ask your permission, sir, to address a question to you, just one. "'Go ahead, sir. "'You said we'd be free aboard your vessel. "'Completely. "'Then I would ask what you mean by this freedom. "'Why, the freedom to come, go, see, "'and even closely observe everything happening here, "'except under certain rare circumstances. "'In short, the freedom we ourselves enjoy, "'my companions and I.' "'It was obvious that we did not understand each other. "'Pardon me, sir,' I went on. "'But that's merely the freedom that every prisoner has, "'the freedom to pace his cell. "'That's not enough for us. "'Nevertheless, it will have to do. "'What? "'We must give up seeing our homeland, friends, and relatives ever again? "'Yes, sir. "'But giving up that intolerable earthly yoke "'that some men call freedom "'is perhaps less painful than you think.' "'By thunder!' Ned Land shouted. "'I'll never promise. "'I won't try getting out of here.' "'I didn't ask for such a promise, Mr. Land,' the commander replied coldly. "'Sir,' I replied, flaring up in spite of myself, "'you're taking unfair advantage of us. This is sheer cruelty.' "'No, sir. It's an act of mercy. You're my prisoners of war. I've cared for you when, with a single word, I could plunge you back into the ocean depths. You attack me. You've just stumbled on a secret no living man must probe, the secret of my entire existence. Do you think I'll send you back to a world that must know nothing more of me?' "'Never. By keeping you on board, it isn't you whom I care for, it's me.' These words indicated that the commander pursued a policy impervious to arguments. "'Then, sir,' I went on, "'you give us quite simply a choice between life and death.' "'Quite simply.' "'My friends,' I said, "'to a question couched in these terms our answer can be taken for granted.' "'but no solemn promises bind us to the commander of this vessel?' "'None, sir,' the stranger replied. "'Then, in a gentler voice, he went on. "'Now, allow me to finish what I have to tell you. "'I've heard of you, Professor Aronnax. "'You, if not your companions, won't perhaps complain too much about the stroke of fate "'that has brought us together. 
Among the books that make up my favorite reading, you'll find the work you've published on the great ocean depths. I've pored over it. You've taken your studies as far as terrestrial science can go. But you don't know everything because you haven't seen everything. Let me tell you, Professor, you won't regret the time you spend aboard my vessel. You're going to voyage through a land of wonders. Stunned amazement will probably be your habitual state of mind. It will be a long while before you tire of the sights constantly before your eyes. I'm going to make another underwater tour of the world, perhaps my last, who knows, and I'll review everything I've studied in the depths of these seas that I've crossed so often, and you can be my fellow student. Starting this very day, you'll enter a new element. You'll see what no human being has ever seen before, since my men and I no longer count, and, thanks to me, you're going to learn the ultimate secrets of our planet. I can't deny it. The commander's words had a tremendous effect on me. He had caught me on my weak side, and I momentarily forgot that not even this sublime experience was worth the loss of my freedom. Besides, I counted on the future to resolve this important question. So I was content to reply, Sir, even though you've cut yourself off from humanity, I can see that you haven't disowned all human feeling. We're castaways whom you've charitably taken aboard. We'll never forget that. Speaking for myself, I don't rule out that the interests of science could override even the need for freedom, which promises me that, in exchange, our encounter will provide great rewards. I thought the commander would offer me his hand to seal our agreement. He did nothing of the sort. I regretted that. One last question, I said, just as this inexplicable being seemed ready to withdraw. Ask it, Professor. By what name am I to call you? Sir, the commander replied, to you, I'm simply Captain Nemo. To me, you and your companions are simply passengers on the Nautilus. Captain Nemo called out. A steward appeared. The captain gave him his orders in that strange language I couldn't even identify. Then, turning to the Canadian and Conseil, a meal is waiting for you in your cabin, he told them. "'Kindly follow this man.' "'That's an offer I can't refuse,' the harpooner replied. "'After being confined for over thirty hours, "'he and Conceal were finally out of this cell. "'And now, Professor Aranax, our own breakfast is ready. "'Allow me to lead the way.' "'Yours to command, Captain.' "'I followed Captain Nemo, and as soon as I passed through the doorway, I went down a kind of electrically lit passageway that resembled a gangway on a ship. After a stretch of some ten meters, a second door opened before me. I then entered a dining room, decorated and furnished in austere good taste. Inlaid with ebony trim, tall oaken sideboards stood at both ends of this room, and sparkling on their shelves were staggered rows of earthenware porcelain and glass of incalculable value. There silver-plated dinnerware gleamed under rays pouring from light fixtures in the ceiling, whose glare was softened and tempered by delicately painted designs. In the center of this room stood a table, richly spread. Captain Nemo indicated the place I was to occupy. "'Be seated,' he told me, "'and eat like the famished man you must be.' Our breakfast consisted of several dishes whose contents were all supplied by the sea— and some foods whose nature and derivation were unknown to me. They were good, I admit, but with a peculiar flavor to which I would soon grow accustomed. These various foods seemed to be rich in phosphorus, and I thought that they, too, must have been of marine origin. Captain Nemo stared at me. I had asked him nothing, but he read my thoughts, and on his own he answered the questions I was itching to address him. "'Most of these dishes are new to you,' he told me. "'But you can consume them without fear. "'They're healthy and nourishing. "'I renounced terrestrial foods long ago, "'and I'm none the worse for it. "'My crews are strong and full of energy, "'and they eat what I eat.' "'So,' I said, "'all these foods are products of the sea.' "'Yes, Professor. "'The sea supplies all my needs. "'Sometimes I cast my nets in our wake, "'and I pull them up ready to burst. "'Sometimes I go hunting, right in the midst of this element "'that has long seemed so far out of man's reach, "'and I corner the game that dwells in my underwater forests, "'like the flocks of old Proteus, King Neptune's shepherd. "'My herds graze without fear on the ocean's immense prairies. "'There I own vast properties that I harvest myself, 
and which are forever sown by the hand of the Creator of all things. I stared at Captain Nemo in definite astonishment, and I answered him, Sir, I understand perfectly how your nets can furnish excellent fish for your table. I understand less how you can chase aquatic game in your underwater forests, but how a piece of red meat, no matter how small, can figure in your menu that I don't understand at all. Nor I, sir, Captain Nemo answered me. I never touch the flesh of land animals. Nevertheless, this, I went on, pointing to a dish where some slices of loin were still left. What you believe to be red meat, Professor, is nothing other than loin of sea turtle. Similarly, here are some dolphin livers you might mistake for stewed pork. My chef is a skillful food processor who excels at pickling and preserving these various exhibits from the ocean. Feel free to sample all of these foods. Here are some preserves of sea cucumber that a Malaysian could declare to be unrivaled in the entire world. Here's cream from milk furnished by the udders of cetaceans and sugar from the huge fucus plants in the North Sea. And finally, allow me to offer you some marmalade of sea anemone equal to that from the tastiest fruits. So I sampled away, more as a curiosity seeker than an epicure, while Captain Nemo delighted me with his incredible anecdotes. But this sea, Professor Aranax, he told me, this prodigious, inexhaustible wet nurse of a sea not only feeds me, she dresses me as well. That fabric covering you was woven from the masses of filaments that anchor certain seashells. As the ancients were wont to do, it was dyed with purple ink from the murex snail, and shaded with violet tints that I extract from a marine slug, the Mediterranean sea hair. The perfumes you'll find on the washstand in your cabin were produced from the oozings of marine plants. Your mattress was made from the ocean's softest eel grass. Your quill pen will be whalebone, your ink a juice secreted by cuttlefish or squid. Everything comes to me from the sea, just as some day everything will return to it. You love the sea, Captain? Yes, I love it. The sea is the be-all and end-all. It covers seven-tenths of the planet Earth. Its breath is clean and healthy. It's an immense wilderness where a man is never lonely because he feels life astir on every side. The sea is simply the vehicle for our prodigious unearthly mode of existence. It's simply movement and love. It's living infinity, as one of your poets put it, and in essence, Professor. Nature is here, made manifest by all three of her kingdoms, mineral, vegetable, and animal. The last of these is amply represented by the four zoophyte groups, three classes of articulates, five classes of mollusks, and three vertebrate classes, mammals, reptiles, and those countless legions of fish, an infinite order of animals totaling more than thirteen thousand species, of which only one-tenth belong to fresh water. The sea is a vast pool of nature. Our globe began with the sea, so to speak, and who can say we won't end with it? Here lies supreme tranquillity. The sea doesn't belong to tyrants. On its surface they can still exercise their iniquitous claims, battle each other, devour each other, haul every earthly horror. But thirty feet below sea level their dominion ceases. Their influence fades. Their power vanishes. Ah, sir, live, live in the heart of the seas. Here alone lies independence. Here I recognize no superiors. Here I am free." Captain Nemo suddenly fell silent in the midst of this enthusiastic outpouring. Had he let himself get carried away, past the bounds of his habitual reserve? Had he said too much? For a few moments he strolled up and down, all a quiver. Then his nerves grew calmer, his facial features recovered their usual icy composure, and, turning to me, "'Now, Professor,' he said, "'if you'd like to inspect the Nautilus, I'm yours to command.'" Part One. CHAPTER Eleven, THE NAUTILUS Captain Nemo stood up. I followed him. Contrived at the rear of the dining-room, a double door opened, and I entered a room whose dimensions equaled the one I had just left. It was a library. Tall, black, rosewood bookcases, inlaid with copperwork, held on their wide shelves a large number of uniformly bound books. These furnishings followed the contours of the room— their lower parts leading to huge couches upholstered in maroon leather and curved for maximum comfort. Light, movable reading stands, which could be pushed away or pulled near as desired, allowed books to be positioned on them for easy study. In the center stood a huge table covered with pamphlets, 
among which some newspapers long out of date were visible. Electric light flooded this whole harmonious totality, falling from four frosted half-globes set in the scrollwork of the ceiling. I stared in genuine wonderment at this room so ingeniously laid out, and I couldn't believe my eyes. "'Captain Nemo,' I told my host, who had just stretched out on a couch, "'this is a library that would do credit to more than one continental palace, and I truly marvel to think it can go with you into the deepest seas.' "'Where could one find greater silence or solitude, Professor?' Captain Nemo replied. "'Did your study at the museum afford you such a perfect retreat?' "'No, sir. And I might add that it's quite a humble one next to yours. You own six thousand or seven thousand volumes here.' Twelve thousand, Professor Aronnax. They're my sole remaining ties with dry land. But I was done with the shore the day my Nautilus submerged for the first time under the waters.' That day I purchased my last volumes, my last pamphlets, my last newspapers, and ever since I've chosen to believe that humanity no longer thinks or writes. In any event, Professor, these books are at your disposal, and you may use them freely. I thanked Captain Nemo, and approached the shelves of this library. Written in every language, books on science, ethics, and literature were there in abundance. But I didn't see a single work on economics— they seemed to be strictly banned on board. One odd detail. All these books were shelved indiscriminately without regard to the language in which they were written, and this jumble proved that the Nautilus's captain could read fluently whatever volumes he chanced to pick up. Among these books I noted masterpieces by the greats of ancient and modern times. In other words, all of humanity's finest achievements in history, poetry, fiction, and science, from Homer to Victor Hugo, from Xenophon to Michelet, from Rabelais to Madame Georges Sand. But science, in particular, represented the major investment of this library. Books on mechanics, ballistics, hydrography, meteorology, geography, geology, and so forth, held a place there no less important than works on natural history, and I realized that they made up the captain's chief reading. There I saw the complete works of Humboldt, the complete Arago, as well as works by Foucault, Henri Saint, Claire de Ville, Chalet, Mune Edwards, Quatrefages, Jean Tyndall, Faraday, Berthelot, Father Secchi, Peterman, Commander Maury, Louis Agassiz, etc., plus the transactions of France's Academy of Sciences, bulletins from the various geographical societies, and so forth, and, in a prime location, those two volumes on the great ocean depths that had perhaps earned me this comparatively charitable welcome from Captain Nemo. Among the works of Joseph Bertrand, his book entitled The Founders of Astronomy, even gave me a definite date, and since I knew it had appeared in the course of 1865, I concluded that the fitting out of the Nautilus hadn't taken place before then. Accordingly, three years ago at the most, Captain Nemo had begun his underwater existence. Moreover, I hoped some books even more recent would permit me to pinpoint the date precisely. But I had plenty of time to look for them, and I didn't want to put off any longer our stroll through the wonders of the Nautilus. "'Sir,' I told the captain, "'thank you for placing this library at my disposal. "'There are scientific treasures here, "'and I will take advantage of them.' "'This room isn't only a library,' Captain Nemo said. "'It's also a smoking room.' "'A smoking room?' I exclaimed. "'Then one may smoke on board?' "'Surely. "'In that case, sir, "'I'm forced to believe that you've kept up relations with Havana.' "'None whatever,' the captain replied. "'Try this cigar, Professor Aronnax, and even though it doesn't come from Havana, it will satisfy you if you're a connoisseur.' I took the cigar offered me, whose shape recalled those from Cuba, but it seemed to be made of gold leaf. I lit it at a small brazier, supported by an elegant bronze stand, and I inhaled my first whiffs with the relish of a smoker who hasn't had a puff in days. "'It's excellent,' I said. "'But it's not from the tobacco plant.' "'Right.' the captain replied. This tobacco comes from neither Havana nor the Orient. It's a kind of nicotine-rich seaweed that the ocean supplies me, albeit sparingly. Do you still miss your Cubans, sir? Captain, I scorn them from this day forward. Then smoke these cigars whenever you like, without debating their origin. They bear no government seal of approval, but I imagine they're none the worse for it. On the contrary— 
Just then Captain Nemo opened a door facing the one by which I had entered the library, and I passed into an immense, splendidly lit lounge. It was a huge quadrilateral with canted corners, ten meters long, six wide, five high. A luminous ceiling decorated with delicate arabesques distributed a soft, clear daylight over all the wonders gathered in this museum. For a museum it truly was, in which clever hands had spared no expense to amass every natural and artistic treasure, displaying them with the helter-skelter picturesqueness that distinguishes a painter's studio. Some thirty pictures by the masters, uniformly framed and separated by gleaming panoplies of arms, adorned walls on which were stretched tapestries of austere design. There I saw canvases of the highest value, the likes of which I had marveled at in private European collections and art exhibitions. The various schools of the old masters were represented by a Raphael Madonna, a virgin by Leonardo da Vinci, a nymph by Correggio, a woman by Titian, an adoration of the Magi by Veronese, an assumption of the Virgin by Murillo, a Holbein portrait, a monk by Velazquez, a martyr by Ribera, a village fair by Rubens, two Flemish landscapes by Teniers, three literal genre paintings by Gerard Dow, Metsu, and Paul Potter, two canvases by Jericho and Proudhon, plus seascapes by Backhuysen and Vernet. Among the works of modern art were pictures signed by Delacroix, Ingres, Decombe, Troyon, Messonnier, Daubigny, etc., and some wonderful miniature statues in marble or bronze, modeled after antiquity's finest originals, stood on their pedestals in the corners of this magnificent museum. As the Nautilus's commander had predicted, my mind was already starting to fall into that promised state of stunned amazement. Professor, this strange man then said, you must excuse the informality with which I receive you and the disorder reigning in this lounge. Sir, I replied, without prying into who you are, might I venture to identify you as an artist? A collector, sir, nothing more. Formerly I loved acquiring these beautiful works created by the hand of man. I sought them greedily, ferreted them out tirelessly, and I've been able to gather some objects of great value. They're my last mementos of those shores that are now dead for me. In my eyes, your modern artists are already as old as the ancients. They've existed for two thousand or three thousand years, and I mix them up in my mind. The masters are ageless. What about these composers? I said, pointing to sheet music by Weber, Rossini, Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, Meyerbeer, Harold, Wagner, Aubert, Gounod, Victor Massé, and a number of others scattered over a full-size piano organ which occupied one of the wall panels in this lounge. These composers, Captain Nemo answered me, are the contemporaries of Orpheus, because in the annals of the dead all chronological differences fade. And I'm dead, Professor, quite as dead as those friends of yours sleeping six feet under. Captain Nemo fell silent and seemed lost in reverie. I regarded him with intense excitement, silently analyzing his strange facial expression. Leaning his elbow on the corner of a valuable mosaic table, he no longer saw me, he had forgotten my very presence. I didn't disturb his meditations, but continued to pass and review the curiosities that enriched this lounge. After the works of art, natural rarities predominated. They consisted chiefly of plants, shells, and other exhibits from the ocean that must have been Captain Nemo's own personal finds. In the middle of the lounge, a jet of water, electrically lit, fell back into a basin made from a single giant clam. The delicately festooned rim of this shell, supplied by the biggest mollusk in the class, a cephala, measured about six meters in circumference, so it was even bigger than those fine giant clams given to King Francois I by the Republic of Venice, and which the Church of St. Sulpice in Paris has made into two gigantic holy water fonts. Around this basin, inside elegant glass cases fastened with copper bands, there were classified and labeled the most valuable marine exhibits ever put before the eyes of a naturalist. My professorial glee may easily be imagined. The zoophyte branch offered some very unusual specimens from its two groups, the polyps and the echinoderms. In the first group, organ-pipe coral, gorgonian coral arranged into fan shapes, soft sponges from Syria, Isis coral from the Malacca Islands, sea pen coral, wonderful coral of the genus Virgularia from the waters of Norway, various coral of the genus Umbellularia, 
Alcinarian coral, then a whole series of those madrepores that my mentor, Professor Milne Edwards, has so shrewdly classified into divisions, and among which I noted the wonderful genus Flabellina, as well as the genus Oculina from Reunion Island, plus a Neptune's chariot from the Caribbean Sea. Every superb variety of coral, and in short, every species of these unusual polypatteries that congregate to form entire islands that will one day turn into continents. Among the echinoderms, notable for being covered with spines, starfish, feather stars, sea lilies, free-swimming crinoids, brittle stars, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, etc., represented a complete collection of the individuals in this group. An excitable conchologist would surely have fainted dead away before other more numerous giant cases in which were classified specimens from the mollusk branch. There I saw a collection of incalculable value that I haven't time to describe completely. Among these exhibits, I'll mention, just for the record, an elegant royal hammer shell from the Indian Ocean, whose evenly spaced white spots stood out sharply against a base of red and brown, an imperial spiny oyster, brightly coloured, bristling with thorns, a specimen rare to European museums, whose value I estimated at 20,000 francs, a common hammer shell from the seas near Queensland, very hard to come by, exotic cockles from Senegal, fragile white bivalve shells that a single breath could pop like a soap bubble, several varieties of watering pot shell from Java, a sort of limestone tube fringed with leafy folds and much fought over by collectors, a whole series of top-shell snails, greenish-yellow ones fished up from American seas, others colored reddish-brown that patronized the waters off Queensland, the former coming from the Gulf of Mexico and notable for their overlapping shells, the latter some sun-carrier shells found in the southernmost seas, finally and rarest of all, the magnificent spurred star-shell from New Zealand, then some wonderful peppery furrow shells, several valuable species of cythera clams and venice clams, the trellis wintletrap snail from Trankabar on India's eastern shore, a marbled turban snail gleaming with mother-of-pearl, green parrot shells from the seas of China, the virtually unknown cone snail from the genus Conodulus, every variety of cowrie used as money in India and Africa, a glory of the seas, the most valuable shell in the East Indies, finally, common periwinkles, dofinula snails, Turret snails, violet snails, European cowries, volute snails, olive shells, mitre shells, helmet shells, murex snails, whelks, harp shells, spiky periwinkles, triton snails, horn shells, spindle shells, conch shells, spider conchs, limpets, glass snails, sea butterflies, every kind of delicate, fragile seashell that science has baptized with its most delightful names. Aside, and in special compartments, strings of supremely beautiful pearls were spread out, the electric light flecking them with little fiery sparks. Pink pearls pooled from salt water, fan shells in the Red Sea, green pearls from the rainbow abalone, yellow, blue, and black pearls, the unusual handiwork of various mollusks from every ocean and of certain mussels from rivers up north. In short, several specimens of incalculable worth that had been oozed by the rarest of shellfish. Some of these pearls were bigger than a pigeon egg, they more than equaled the one that the explorer Tavernier sold the Shah of Persia for three million francs, and they surpassed that other pearl owned by the Imam of Muscat, which I had believed to be unrivaled in the entire world. Consequently, to calculate the value of this collection was, I should say, impossible. Captain Nemo must have spent millions in acquiring these different specimens, and I was wondering what financial resources he tapped to satisfy his collector's fancies, when these words interrupted me. "'You're examining my shells, Professor. "'They're indeed able to fascinate a naturalist, "'but for me they have an added charm, "'since I've collected every one of them with my own two hands, "'and not a sea on the globe has escaped my investigations.' "'I understand, Captain. "'I understand your delight at strolling in the midst of this wealth. "'You're a man who gathers his treasure in person.' No museum in Europe owns such a collection of exhibits from the ocean. But if I exhaust all my wonderment on them, I'll have nothing left for the ship that carries them. I have absolutely no wish to probe those secrets of yours, but I confess that my curiosity is aroused to the limit by this Nautilus, the motor power it contains, the equipment enabling it to operate the ultra-powerful force that brings it to life. I see some instruments hanging on the walls of this lounge whose purposes are unknown to me. May I learn, Professor Aranax? K. 
Captain Nemo answered me. "'I've said you'd be free aboard my vessel, so no part of the Nautilus is off-limits to you. You may inspect it in detail, and I'll be delighted to act as your guide.' "'I don't know how to thank you, sir, but I won't abuse your good nature. I would only ask you about the uses intended for these instruments of physical measure.' "'Professor, these same instruments are found in my stateroom, where I'll have the pleasure of explaining their functions to you. But beforehand, come inspect the cabin set aside for you. You need to learn how you'll be lodged aboard the Nautilus.' I followed Captain Nemo, who, via one of the doors cut into the lounge's canted corners, led me back down the ship's gangways. He took me to the bow, and there I found not just a cabin, but an elegant stateroom with a bed, a washstand, and various other furnishings. I could only thank my host. "'Your stateroom adjoins mine,' he told me, opening a door, "'and mine leads into that lounge we've just left.' I entered the captain's stateroom. It had an austere, almost monastic appearance, an iron bedstead, a work-table, some washstand fixtures, subdued lighting, no luxuries, just the bare necessities. Captain Nemo showed me to a bench. "'Kindly be seated,' he told me. I sat, and he began speaking as follows. Part 1, Chapter 12 Everything Through Electricity "'Sir,' Captain Nemo said, showing me the instruments hanging on the walls of his stateroom. These are the devices needed to navigate the Nautilus. Here, as in the lounge, I always have them before my eyes, and they indicate my position and exact heading in the midst of the ocean. You're familiar with some of them, such as the thermometer, which gives the temperature inside the Nautilus, the barometer, which measures the heaviness of the outside air and forecasts changes in the weather the humidistat, which indicates the degree of dryness in the atmosphere, the storm-glass, whose mixture decomposes to foretell the arrival of tempests, the compass, which steers my course, the sextant, which takes the sun's altitude and tells me my latitude, chronometers, which allow me to calculate my longitude, and finally, spy-glasses for both day and night, enabling me to scrutinize every point of the horizon once the Nautilus has risen to the surface of the waves." "'These are the normal navigational instruments,' I replied, "'and I'm familiar with their uses. "'But no doubt these others answer pressing needs unique to the Nautilus. "'That dial I see there with the needle moving across it, "'isn't it a pressure gauge?' "'It is indeed a pressure gauge. "'It's placed in contact with the water, "'and it indicates the outside pressure on our hull, "'which in turn gives me the depth at which my submarine is sitting. "'And these are some new breed of sounding line?' They're thermometric sounding lines that report water temperatures in the different strata. And these other instruments, whose functions I can't even guess. Here, Professor, I need to give you some background information, Captain Nemo said, so kindly hear me out. He fell silent for some moments. Then he said, There's a powerful, obedient, swift and effortless force that can be bent to any use, and which reigns supreme aboard my vessel. It does everything— it lights me. It warms me. It's the soul of my mechanical equipment. This force is electricity. Electricity? I exclaimed in some surprise. Yes, sir. But, Captain, you have a tremendous speed of movement that doesn't square with the strength of electricity. Until now, its dynamic potential has remained quite limited, capable of producing only small amounts of power. Professor, Captain Nemo replied, my electricity isn't the run-of-the-mill variety, and with your permission, I'll leave it at that. I won't insist, sir, and I'll rest content with simply being flabbergasted at your results. I would ask one question, however, which you needn't answer if it's indiscreet. The electric cells you use to generate this marvelous force must be depleted very quickly. Their zinc component, for example. How do you replace it since you no longer stay in contact with the shore? That question deserves an answer. Captain Nemo replied. First off, I'll mention that at the bottom of the sea there exist veins of zinc, iron, silver, and gold, whose mining would quite certainly be feasible. But I've tapped none of these land-based metals, and I wanted to make demands only on the sea itself for the sources of my electricity. The sea itself? Yes, Professor. And there was no shortage of such sources. In fact, by establishing a circuit between two wires immersed to different depths, 
I'd be able to obtain electricity through the diverging temperatures they experience. But I prefer to use a more practical procedure. And that is, you're familiar with the composition of salt water. In 1,000 grams, one finds 96.5% water and about 2.66 sodium chloride, then small amounts of magnesium chloride, potassium chloride, magnesium bromide, sulfate of magnesia, calcium sulfate, and calcium carbonate. Hence, you observe that sodium chloride is encountered there in significant proportions. Now then, it's this sodium that I extract from salt water and with which I compose my electric cells. Sodium? Yes, sir. Mixed with mercury, it forms an amalgam that takes the place of zinc in Bunsen cells. The mercury is never depleted. Only the sodium is consumed, and the sea itself gives me that. Beyond this, I'll mention that sodium batteries have been found to generate the greater energy, and their electromotor strength is twice that of zinc batteries. Captain, I fully understand the excellence of sodium under the conditions in which you are placed. The sea contains it. Fine. But it still has to be produced, uh, in short, extracted. And how do you accomplish this? Obviously, your batteries could do the extracting, but... If I'm not mistaken, the consumption of sodium needed by your electric equipment would be greater than the quantity you'd extract. It would come about, then, that in the process of producing your sodium, you'd use up more than you'd make. Accordingly, Professor, I don't extract it with batteries. Quite simply, I utilize the heat of coal from the earth. From the earth? I said, my voice going up on the word. We'll say coal from the seafloor, if you prefer, Captain Nemo replied. "'And you can mine these veins of underwater coal?' "'You'll watch me work them, Professor Aronnax. "'I ask only a little patience of you, "'since you'll have ample time to be patient. "'Just remember one thing. "'I owe everything to the ocean. "'It generates electricity, "'and electricity gives the Nautilus heat, "'light, motion, and, in a word, life itself. "'But not the air you breathe.' Oh, I could produce the air needed on board, but it would be pointless, since I can rise to the surface of the sea whenever I like. However, even though electricity doesn't supply me with breathable air, it at least operates the powerful pumps that store it under pressure in special tanks, which, if need be, allows me to extend my stay in the lower strata for as long as I want. Captain, I replied, I'll rest content with marveling. You've obviously found what all mankind will surely find one day— the true dynamic power of electricity. "'I'm not so certain they'll find it,' Captain Nemo replied icily. "'But be that as it may, you're already familiar with the first use I've found for this valuable force. It lights us, and with the uniformity and continuity not even possessed by sunlight. Now, look at that clock. It's electric. It runs with an accuracy rivaling the finest chronometers.' I've had it divided into twenty-four hours like Italian clocks, since neither day nor night, sun nor moon exist for me, but only this artificial light that I import into the depths of the seas. See? Right now it's ten o'clock in the morning. That's perfect. Another use for electricity. That dial hanging before our eyes indicates how fast the Nautilus is going. An electric wire puts it in contact with the patent log. This needle shows me the actual speed of my submersible, and— Hold on. Just now we're proceeding at the moderate pace of fifteen miles per hour. It's marvelous, I replied, and I truly see, Captain, how right you are to use this force. It's sure to take the place of wind, water, and steam. But that's not all, Professor Aranax, Captain Nemo said, standing up. And if you'd care to follow me, we'll inspect the Nautilus's stern. In essence— I was already familiar with the whole forward part of this underwater boat, and here are its exact subdivisions going from amidships to its spur. The dining room, five meters long, and separated from the library by a watertight bulkhead. In other words, it couldn't be penetrated by the sea. The library, five meters long. The main lounge, ten meters long, separated from the captain's stateroom by a second watertight bulkhead. The aforesaid stateroom, five meters long. Mine, two and a half meters long. "'and finally air tanks seven and a half meters long "'and extending to the stem post. "'Total, a length of thirty-five meters. "'Doors were cut into the watertight bulkheads "'and were shut hermetically by means of india-rubber seals, "'which ensured complete safety aboard the Nautilus "'in the event of a leak in any one section. 
I followed Captain Nemo down gangways located for easy transit, and I arrived amidships. There I found a sort of shaft heading upward between two watertight bulkheads. An iron ladder clamped to the wall led to the shaft's upper end. I asked the captain what this ladder was for. "'It goes to the skiff,' he replied. "'What? You have a skiff?' I replied in some astonishment. "'Surely. An excellent longboat, light and unsinkable, which is used for excursions and fishing trips. "'But when you want to set out, don't you have to return to the surface of the sea?' "'By no means. The skiff is attached to the top side of the Nautilus's hull, and is set in a cavity expressly designed to receive it. It's completely decked over, absolutely watertight, and held solidly in place by bolts. This ladder leads to a manhole cut into the Nautilus's hull, and corresponding to a comparable hole cut into the side of the skiff. I insert myself through this double opening into the longboat. My crew closes up the hole belonging to the Nautilus. I close up the one belonging to the skiff, simply by screwing it into place. I undo the bolts, holding the skiff to the submersible, and the longboat rises with prodigious speed to the surface of the sea. I then open the deck paneling, carefully closed until that point. I upmast and hoist sail, or I take out my oars, and I go for a spin. But how do you return to the ship? I don't, Professor Aronnax. The Nautilus returns to me. At your command? At my command. An electric wire connects me to the ship. I fire off a telegram, and that's that. Right, I said, tipsy from all these wonders. Nothing to it. After passing the well of the companionway that led to the platform, I saw a cabin two meters long in which Conseil and Ned Land, enraptured with their meal, were busy devouring it to the last crumb. Then a door opened into the galley, three meters long, and located between the vessel's huge storage lockers. There, even more powerful and obedient than gas, electricity did most of the cooking. Arriving under the stoves, wires transmitted to platinum griddles a heat that was distributed and sustained with perfect consistency. It also heated a distilling mechanism that, via evaporation, supplied excellent drinking water. Next to this galley was a bathroom, conveniently laid out, with faucets supplying hot or cold water at will. After the galley came the crew's quarters, five meters long. But the door was closed, and I couldn't see its accommodations, which might have told me the number of men it took to operate the Nautilus. At the far end stood a fourth watertight bulkhead, separating the crew's quarters from the engine room. A door opened, and I stood in the compartment where Captain Nemo, indisputably a world-class engineer, had set up his locomotive equipment. Brightly lit, the engine room measured at least twenty meters in length. It was divided by function into two parts— the first contained the cells for generating electricity, the second that mechanism transmitting movement to the propeller. Right off, I detected an odor permeating the compartment that was sui generis. Captain Nemo noticed the negative impression it made on me. That, he told me, is a gaseous discharge caused by our use of sodium, but it's only a mild inconvenience. In any event, every morning we sanitize the ship by ventilating it in the open air. Meanwhile, I examined the Nautilus's engine with a fascination easy to imagine. "'You observe,' Captain Nemo told me, "'that I use Bunsen cells, not Rumkorff cells. The latter would be ineffectual. One uses fewer Bunsen cells, but they're big and strong, and experience has proved their superiority. The electricity generated here makes its way to the stern, where electromagnets of huge size activate a special system of levers and gears that transmit movement to the propeller's shaft. The latter has a diameter of six meters, a pitch of 7.5 meters, and can do up to 120 revolutions per minute. And that gives you a speed of 50 miles per hour. There lay a mystery, but I didn't insist on exploring it. How could electricity work with such power? Where did this nearly unlimited engine originate? Was it in the extraordinary voltage obtained from some new kind of induction coil? Could its transmission have been immeasurably increased by some unknown system of levers? This was the point I couldn't grasp. Captain Nemo, I said, I'll vouch for the results and not try to explain them. I've seen the Nautilus at work out in front of the Abraham Lincoln, and I know where I stand on its speed, but... "'It isn't enough just to move. "'We have to see where we're going. "'We must be able to steer right or left, up or down. 
How do you reach the lower depths, where you meet an increasing resistance that's assessed in hundreds of atmospheres? How do you rise back to the surface of the ocean? Finally, how do you keep your ship at whatever level suits you? Am I indiscreet in asking you all these things? Not at all, Professor, the captain answered me with a slight hesitation, since you'll never leave this underwater boat. Come into the lounge. It's actually our workroom, and there you'll learn the full story about the Nautilus. Part 1, Chapter 13 Some Figures A moment later we were seated on a couch in the lounge, cigars between our lips. The captain placed before my eyes a working drawing that gave the ground plan, cross-section, and side view of the Nautilus. Then he began his description as follows. Here, Professor Aranex, are the different dimensions of this boat now transporting you. It's a very long cylinder with conical ends. It noticeably takes the shape of a cigar, a shape already adopted in London for several projects of the same kind. The length of this cylinder, from end to end, is exactly seventy meters, and its maximum breadth of beam is eight meters, so it isn't quite built on the ten-to-one ratio of your high-speed steamers, but its lines are sufficiently long, and they're tapering gradual enough so that the displaced water easily slips past and poses no obstacle to the ship's movements. These two dimensions allow you to obtain, via a simple calculation, the surface area and volume of the Nautilus. Its surface area totals 1,011.45 square meters. Its volume, 1,507.2 cubic meters, which is tantamount to saying that when it's completely submerged, it displaces 1,500 cubic meters of water, or weighs 1,500 metric tons. In drawing up plans for a ship meant to navigate underwater, I wanted it when floating on the waves, to lie nine-tenths below the surface and to emerge only one-tenth. Consequently, under these conditions, it needed to displace only nine-tenths of its volume, hence 1,356.48 cubic meters. In other words, it was to weigh only that same number of metric tons. So I was obliged not to exceed this weight while building it to the aforesaid dimensions. The Nautilus is made up of two holes, one inside the other, between them, joining them together, are iron T-bars that give this ship the utmost rigidity. In fact, thanks to this cellular arrangement, it has the resistance of a stone block, as if it were completely solid. Its plating can't give way. It's self-adhering and not dependent on the tightness of its rivets, and due to the perfect union of its materials, the solidarity of its construction allows it to defy the most violent seas. The two hulls are manufactured from boilerplate steel, whose relative density is 7.8 times that of water. The first hull has a thickness of no less than 5 centimeters and weighs 394.96 metric tons. My second hull, the outer cover, includes a keel 50 centimeters high by 25 wide, which by itself weighs 62 metric tons. This hull, the engine, the ballast, the various accessories and accommodations, plus the bulkheads and interior braces, have a combined weight of 961.52 metric tons, which, when added to 394.96 metric tons, gives us the desired total of 1,356.48 metric tons. Clear? Clear, I replied. So, the captain went on, when the Nautilus lies on the waves under these conditions— one-tenth of it does emerge above water. Now then, if I provide some ballast tanks equal in capacity to that one-tenth, hence able to hold 150.72 metric tons, and if I fill them with water, the boat then displaces 1,507.2 metric tons, or it weighs that much, and it would be completely submerged. That's what comes about, Professor. These ballast tanks exist within easy access in the lower reaches of the Nautilus— I open some stopcocks, the tanks fill, the boat sinks, and it's exactly flush with the surface of the water. Fine, Captain, but now we come to a genuine difficulty. You're able to lie flush with the surface of the ocean. That I understand. But lower down, while diving beneath that surface, is it your submersible going to encounter a pressure and consequently undergo an upward thrust that must be assessed at one atmosphere per every thirty feet of water, hence at about one kilogram per each square centimeter? Precisely, sir. Then, unless you fill up the whole Nautilus, I don't see how you can force it down into the heart of these liquid masses. 
Professor, Captain Nemo replied. Static objects mustn't be confused with dynamic ones, or will be open to serious error. Comparatively little effort is spent in reaching the ocean's lower regions, because all objects have a tendency to become sinkers. Follow my logic here? I'm all ears, Captain. When I wanted to determine what increase in weight the Nautilus needed to be given in order to submerge, I had only to take note of the proportionate reduction in volume that salt water experiences in deeper and deeper strata. Well, that's obvious, I replied. Now then, if water isn't absolutely incompressible, at least it compresses very little. In fact, according to the most recent calculations, this reduction is only point zero 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 four three six per atmosphere, or per every thirty feet of depth. For instance, to go one thousand meters down, I must take into account the reduction in volume that occurs under a pressure equivalent to that from a one thousand meter column of water. In other words, under a pressure of one hundred atmospheres. In this instance, the reduction would be point zero zero four three six. Consequently, I'd have to increase my weight from one thousand five hundred and seven point two metric tons to one thousand five hundred and thirteen point seventy seven. So the added weight would only be six point five seven metric tons. That's all. That's all, Professor Aronix, and the calculation is easy to check. Now then, I have supplementary ballast tanks capable of shipping one hundred metric tons of water, so I can descend to considerable depths. When I want to rise again and lie flush with the surface, all I have to do is expel that water. And if I desire that the Nautilus emerge above the waves to one tenth of its total capacity, I empty all the ballast tanks completely. This logic, backed up by figures, left me without a single objection. I accept your calculations, Captain. I replied, and I'd be ill-mannered to dispute them, since your daily experience bears them out. But at this juncture, I have a hunch that we're still left with one real difficulty. What's that, sir? When you're at a depth of one thousand meters, the Nautilus's plating bears a pressure of one hundred atmospheres. If at this point you want to empty the supplementary ballast tanks in order to lighten your boat and rise to the surface, your pumps must overcome that pressure of one hundred atmospheres, which is one hundred kilograms per each square centimeter. This demands a strength that electricity alone can give me," Captain Nemo said swiftly. "Sir, I repeat." The dynamic power of my engines is nearly infinite. The Nautilus's pumps have prodigious strength, as you must have noticed when their water spouts swept like a torrent over the Abraham Lincoln. Besides, I use my supplementary ballast tanks only to reach an average depth of one thousand five hundred to two thousand meters, and that with a view to conserving my machinery. Accordingly, when I have a mind to visit the ocean depths two or three vertical leagues beneath the surface, I use maneuvers that are more time-consuming but no less infallible. What are they, Captain? I asked. Here I'm naturally led into telling you how the Nautilus is maneuvered. I can't wait to find out. In order to steer this boat to port or starboard, in short, to make turns on a horizontal plane, I use an ordinary wide-bladed rudder that's fastened to the rear of the stern post and worked by a wheel and tackle. But I can also move the Nautilus upward and downward on a vertical plane by the simple method of slanting its two fins, which are attached to its sides at the center of flotation. These fins are flexible, able to assume any position, and can be operated from inside by means of powerful levers. If these fins stay parallel with the boat, the latter moves horizontally. If they slant, the Nautilus follows the angle of that slant, and under its propeller's thrust, either sinks on a diagonal as steep as it suits me. Or rises on that diagonal, and similarly, if I want to return more swiftly to the surface, I throw the propeller in gear, and the water's pressure makes the Nautilus rise vertically as an air balloon inflated with hydrogen lifts swiftly into the skies. Bravo, Captain! I exclaimed. But in the midst of the waters, how can your helmsman follow the course you've given him? My helmsman is stationed behind the windows of a pilot house, which protrudes from the top side of the Nautilus's hull and is fitted with biconvex glass. Is glass capable of resisting such pressures? Perfectly capable, though fragile on impact. Crystal can still offer considerable resistance. In 1864, during experiments on fishing by electric light in the middle of the North Sea, 
glass panes less than seven millimeters thick were seen to resist a pressure of sixteen atmospheres, all the while letting through strong heat generating rays whose warmth was unevenly distributed. Now then, I use glass windows measuring no less than twenty one centimeters at their centers. In other words, they've thirty times the thickness. Fair enough, Captain. But if we're going to see, we need light to drive away the dark, and in the midst of the murky waters, I wonder how your helmsman can. Set astern of the pilot house is a powerful electric reflector whose rays light up the sea for a distance of half a mile. Oh, bravo! Bravo! Three times over, Captain! That explains the phosphorescent glow from this so called Norwell that so puzzled us scientists. Uh, pertinent to this, I'll ask you if the Nautilus's running afoul of the Scotia, which caused such a great uproar, was the result of an accidental encounter. Entirely accidental, sir. I was navigating two meters beneath the surface of the water when the collision occurred. However, I could see that it had no dire consequences. None, sir. But as for your encounter with the Abraham Lincoln... Professor, that troubled me, because it's one of the best ships in the gallant American Navy. But they attacked me and I had to defend myself. All the same, I was content simply to put the frigate in a condition where it could do me no harm. It won't have any difficulty getting repairs at the nearest port. Ah, Commander, I exclaimed with conviction, your Nautilus is truly a marvelous boat. Yes, Professor, Captain Nemo replied with genuine excitement, and I love it as if it were my own flesh and blood. Aboard a conventional ship facing the ocean's perils, danger lurks everywhere. On the surface of the sea, your chief sensation is the constant feeling of an underlying chasm, as the Dutchman Jansen so aptly put it. But below the waves aboard the Nautilus, your heart never fails you. There are no structural deformities to worry about, because the double hull of this boat has the rigidity of iron. No rigging to be worn out by rolling and pitching on the waves, no sails for the wind to carry off, no boilers for steam to burst open, no fires to fear, because this submersible is made of sheet iron, not wood. No coal to run out of, since electricity is its mechanical force. No collisions to fear, because it navigates the watery deep all by itself. No storms to brave, because just a few meters beneath the waves it finds absolute tranquility. There, sir, there's the ideal ship. And if it's true that the engineer has more confidence in a craft than the builder, and the builder more than the captain himself, you can understand the utter abandon with which I place my trust in the Nautilus, since I'm its captain, builder, and engineer all in one. Captain Nemo spoke with winning eloquence. The fire in his eyes and the passion in his gestures transfigured him. Yes, he loved his ship the same way a father loves his child. But one question, perhaps indiscreet, naturally popped up, and I couldn't resist asking it. You're an engineer, then, Captain Nemo? Yes, Professor, he answered me. I studied in London, Paris, and New York back in the days when I was a resident of the Earth's continents. But how were you able to build this wonderful Nautilus in secret? Each part of it, Professor Aronnax, came from a different spot on the globe and reached me at a cover address. Its keel was forged by Crusoe in France, its propeller shaft by Penn and Company in London, the sheet iron plates for its hull by Laird's in Liverpool, its propeller by Scots in Glasgow, its tanks were manufactured by Kale and Company in Paris, its engine by Krupp in Prussia, its spur by the Motala workshops in Sweden, its precision instruments by Hart Brothers in New York, and so forth, and each of these suppliers received my specifications under a different name. But, I went on, once these parts were manufactured, didn't they have to be mounted and adjusted? Professor, I shut up my workshops on a deserted islet in mid-ocean. There, our Nautilus was completed by me and my workmen. In other words, by my gallant companions whom I've molded and educated. Then, when the operation was over, we burned every trace of our stay on that islet, which, if I could have, I'd have blown up. Well, from all this, may I assume that such a boat cost a fortune? An iron ship, Professor Aronnax, runs... One thousand one hundred and twenty-five francs per metric ton. Now then, the Nautilus has a burden of one thousand five hundred metric tons. Consequently, it cost one million six hundred eighty-seven thousand francs. Hence, two million francs, including its accommodations, and four million francs, or five million, with all the collections and works of art it contains. One last question, Captain Nemo. Ask, Professor. Your 
rich then? Infinitely rich, sir. And without any trouble, I could pay off the ten billion franc French national debt. I gaped at the bizarre individual who had just spoken these words. Was he playing on my credulity? Time would tell. Part 1, Chapter 14, The Black Current The part of the planet Earth that the seas occupy has been assessed at 3,832,558 square myriameters, hence more than 38 billion hectares. This liquid mass totals 2,250,000,000 cubic miles and could form a sphere with a diameter of 60 leagues whose weight would be 3 quintillion metric tons. To appreciate such a number, we should remember that a quintillion is to a billion what a billion is to one. In other words, there are as many billions in a quintillion as ones in a billion. Now then, this liquid mass nearly equals the total amount of water that has poured through all the Earth's rivers for the past 40,000 years. During prehistoric times, an era of fire was followed by an era of water. At first there was ocean everywhere. Then, during the Silurian period, the tops of mountains gradually appeared above the waves. Islands emerged, disappeared beneath temporary floods, rose again, were fused to form continents, and finally the Earth's geography settled into what we have today. Solid matter had rested from liquid matter some 37,650,000 square miles, hence 12,916,000,000 hectares. The outlines of the continents allow the seas to be divided into five major parts, the frozen Arctic and Antarctic oceans, the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean extends north to south between the two polar circles and east to west between America and Asia over an expanse of 145 degrees of longitude. It's the most tranquil of the seas. Its currents are wide and slow-moving, its tides moderate, its rainfall abundant. And this was the ocean that I was first destined to cross under these strangest of auspices. "'If you don't mind, Professor,' Captain Nemo told me, We'll determine our exact position and fix the starting point of our voyage. It's fifteen minutes before noon. I'm going to rise to the surface of the water. The captain pressed an electric bell three times. The pumps began to expel water from the ballast tanks. On the pressure gauge, a needle marked the decreasing pressures that indicated the Nautilus's upward progress. Then the needle stopped. Here we are, the captain said. I made my way to the central companionway, which led to the platform. I climbed its metal steps, passed through the open hatches, and arrived topside on the Nautilus. The platform emerged only eighty centimeters above the waves. The Nautilus's bow and stern boasted that spindle-shaped outline that has caused the ship to be compared appropriately to a long cigar. I noted the slight overlap of its sheet-iron plates, which resembled the scales covering the bodies of our big land reptiles. So I had a perfectly natural explanation for why— Despite the best spyglasses, this boat had always been mistaken for a marine animal. Near the middle of the platform, the skiff was half set in the ship's hull, making a slight bulge. Fore and aft stood two cupolas of moderate height, their sides slanting and partly inset with heavy biconvex glass, one reserved for the helmsman steering the Nautilus, the other for the brilliance of the powerful electric beacon lighting his way. The sea was magnificent, the skies clear. This long aquatic vehicle could barely feel the broad undulations of the ocean. A mild breeze out of the east rippled the surface of the water. Free of all mist, the horizon was ideal for taking sights. There was nothing to be seen. Not a reef, not an islet, no more Abraham Lincoln. A deserted immenseness. Raising his sextant, Captain Nemo took the altitude of the sun, which would give him his latitude. He waited for a few minutes until the orb touched the rim of the horizon. While he was taking his sights, he didn't move a muscle, and the instrument couldn't have been steadier in hands made out of marble. Noon, he said. Professor, whenever you're ready. I took one last look at the sea, a little yellowish near the landing places of Japan, and I went below again to the main lounge. There the captain fixed his position and used a chronometer to calculate his longitude, which he double-checked against his previous observations of our angles. Then he told me, "'Professor Aranax, we're in longitude 137 degrees, 15 minutes west.' "'West of which meridian?' I asked quickly, hoping the captain's reply might give me a clue to his nationality. "'Sir,' 
he answered me. I have chronometers variously set to the meridians of Paris, Greenwich, and Washington, D.C., but in your honor, I'll use the one for Paris. This reply told me nothing. I bowed, and the commander went on. We're in longitude 137 degrees 15 minutes west of the meridian of Paris, and latitude 30 degrees 7 minutes north, in other words, about 300 miles from the shores of Japan. At noon on this day of November 8th, we hereby begin our voyage of exploration under the waters. May God be with us, I replied. And now, Professor, the captain added, I'll leave you to your intellectual pursuits. I've set our course east-northeast at a depth of fifty meters. Here are some large-scale charts on which you'll be able to follow that course. The lounge is at your disposal, and with your permission, I'll take my leave. Captain Nemo bowed. I was left to myself, lost in my thoughts. They all centered on the Nautilus's commander. Would I ever learn the nationality of this eccentric man who had boasted of having none? His sworn hate for humanity, a hate that perhaps was bent on some dreadful revenge, what had provoked it? Was he one of those unappreciated scholars, one of those geniuses embittered by the world, as Conseil expressed it, a latter-day Galileo, or maybe one of those men of science like America's Commander Mari, whose careers were ruined by political revolutions? I couldn't say yet. As for me, whom fate had just brought aboard his vessel, whose life he had held in the balance, he had received me coolly, but hospitably. Only, he never took the hand I extended to him. He never extended his own. For an entire hour I was deep in these musings, trying to probe this mystery that fascinated me so. Then my eyes focused on a huge world map displayed on the table, and I put my finger on the very spot where our just-determined longitude and latitude intersected. Like the continents, the sea has its rivers. These are exclusive currents that can be identified by their temperature and color, the most remarkable being the one called the Gulf Stream. Science has defined the global paths of five chief currents, one in the North Atlantic, a second in the South Atlantic, a third in the North Pacific, a fourth in the South Pacific, and a fifth in the Southern Indian Ocean. Also, it's likely that a sixth current used to exist in the northern Indian Ocean when the Caspian and Aral Seas joined up with certain large Asian lakes to form a single uniform expanse of water. Now then, at the spot indicated on the world map, one of these sea-going rivers was rolling by, the Kuroshio of the Japanese, the Black Current. Heated by perpendicular rays from the tropical sun, it leaves the Bay of Bengal, crosses the Strait of Malacca, goes up the shores of Asia, and curves into the North Pacific as far as the Aleutian Islands, carrying along trunks of camphor trees and other local items, the pure indigo of its warm waters sharply contrasting with the ocean's waves. It was this current the Nautilus was about to cross. I watched it on the map with my eyes. I saw it lose itself in the immenseness of the Pacific, and I felt myself swept along with it when Ned Land and Conseil appeared in the lounge doorway. My two gallant companions stood petrified at the sight of the wonders on display. "'Where are we?' the Canadian exclaimed. "'In the Quebec Museum?' "'Begging master's pardon,' Conseil answered. "'But this seems more like the Saumerard Artifacts Exhibition.' "'My friends,' I replied, signaling them to enter. "'You're in neither Canada nor France, but securely aboard the Nautilus, fifty meters below sea level.' "'If Master says so, then so be it,' Conseil answered. "'But in all honesty, this lounge is enough to astonish even someone Flemish like myself.' "'Indulge your astonishment, my friend, and have a look, because there's plenty of work here for a classifier of your talents.' Conseil needed no encouraging.' Bending over the glass cases, the gallant lad was already muttering choice words from the naturalist's vocabulary. Class, gastropoda. Family, Buccinoidea, Genus, cowrie. Species, Suprea, Madagascariensis, and so forth. Meanwhile, Ned Land, less dedicated to conchology, questioned me about my interview with Captain Nemo. Had I discovered who he was, where he came from, where he was heading, how deep he was taking us, in short, a thousand questions— I had no time to answer. I told him everything I knew, or rather, everything I didn't know, and I asked him what he had seen or heard on his part. "'Haven't seen or heard a thing,' the Canadian replied. "'I haven't even spotted the crew of this boat. By any chance could they be electric, too?' "'Electric? Oh, ye gods, uh, I'm half-tempted to believe it. But back to you, Professor Aradax. 
Ned Land said, still hanging on to his ideas. Can't you tell me how many men are on board? Ten, twenty, fifty, a hundred? I'm unable to answer you, Mr. Land. And trust me on this for the time being. Get rid of these notions of taking over the Nautilus or escaping from it. This boat is a masterpiece of modern technology, and I'd be sorry to have missed it. Many people would welcome the circumstances that have been handed us just to walk in the midst of these wonders. So keep calm, and let's see what's happening around us. See? the harpooner exclaimed. There's nothing to see, except we'll ever see from this sheet-iron prison. We're simply running around blindfolded. Ned Land was just pronouncing these last words when we were suddenly plunged into darkness, utter darkness. The ceiling lights went out so quickly, my eyes literally ached, just as if we had experienced the opposite sensation of going from the deepest gloom to the brightest sunlight. We stood stock still, not knowing what surprise was waiting for us, whether pleasant or unpleasant. But a sliding sound became audible. You could tell that some panels were shifting over the Nautilus's sides. "'It's the beginning of the end,' Ned Land said. "'Order, Hydromedusa, Conseil muttered. Suddenly, through two oblong openings, daylight appeared on both sides of the lounge. The liquid masses came into view, brightly lit by the ship's electric outpourings. We were separated from the sea by two panes of glass. Initially, I shuddered at the thought that these fragile partitions could break, but strong copper bands secured them, giving them nearly infinite resistance. The sea was clearly visible for a one-mile radius around the Nautilus. What a sight! What pen could describe it? Who could portray the effects of this light through these translucent sheets of water, the subtlety of its progressive shadings into the ocean's upper and lower strata? The transparency of salt water has long been recognized. Its clarity is believed to exceed that of spring water. The mineral and organic substances it holds in suspension actually increase its translucency. In certain parts of the Caribbean Sea, you can see the sandy bottom with startling distinctness as deep as 145 meters down, and the penetrating power of the sun's rays seems to give out only at a depth of 300 meters. But in this fluid setting traveled by the Nautilus, our electric glow was being generated in the very heart of the waves. It was no longer illuminated water, it was liquid light. If we accept the hypotheses of the microbiologist Ehrenberg, who believes that these underwater depths are lit up by phosphorescent organisms, nature has certainly saved one of her most prodigious sights for residents of the sea, and I could judge for myself from the thousandfold play of the light. On both sides I had windows opening over these unexplored depths. The darkness in the lounge enhanced the brightness outside, and we stared as if this clear glass were the window of an immense aquarium. The Nautilus seemed to be standing still. This was due to the lack of landmarks. But streaks of water parted by the ship's spur sometimes threaded before our eyes with extraordinary speed. In wonderment, we leaned on our elbows before these show windows, and our stunned silence remained unbroken until Conseil said, "'You wanted to see something, Ned, my friend. Well, now you have something to see.' "'How unusual,' the Canadian put in setting aside his tantrums and getaway schemes while submitting to this irresistible allure. "'A man would go on an even greater distance just to stare at such a sight.' "'Ah!' I exclaimed. "'I see our captain's way of life. He's found himself a separate world that saves its most astonishing wonders just for him.' "'But where are the fish?' the Canadian ventured to observe. "'I don't see any fish.' "'Why would you care, Ned, my friend?' Conseil replied. "'since you have no knowledge of them.' "'Me? A fisherman?' Ned Land exclaimed. "'And on this subject a dispute arose between the two friends, "'since both were knowledgeable about fish, "'but from totally different standpoints. "'Everyone knows that fish make up the fourth and last class "'in the vertebrate branch. "'They have been quite aptly defined as "'cold-blooded vertebrates with a double circulatory system, "'breathing through gills and designed to live in water. "'They consist of two distinct series,' the series of bony fish, in other words, those whose spines have vertebrae made of bone, and cartilaginous fish, in other words, those whose spines have vertebrae made of cartilage. Possibly the Canadian was familiar with this distinction, but Conseil knew far more about it, and since he and Ned were now fast friends, he just had to show off. So he told the harpooner, "'Ned, my friend, you're a slayer of fish, a highly skilled fisherman. You've caught a large number of these fascinating animals.' 
but I'll bet you don't know how they're classified. Sure I do, the harpooner replied in all seriousness. They're classified into fish we eat and fish we don't eat. Spoken like a true glutton, Conseil replied. But tell me, are you familiar with the differences between bony fish and cartilaginous fish? Just maybe, Conseil. And how about the subdivisions of these two large classes? I haven't the foggiest notion, the Canadian replied. All right. Listen and learn, Ned, my friend. Bony fish are divided into six orders. Primo, the Acanthopterygians, whose upper jaw is fully formed and free-moving, and whose gills take the shape of a comb. This order consists of fifteen families, in other words, three-quarters of all known fish. Example, the common perch. Pretty fair eaten, Ned Land replied. Secundo, Conseil went on, the abdominals, whose pelvic fins hang under the abdomen to the rear of the pectorals, but aren't attached to the shoulder bone, an order that's divided into five families and makes up the great majority of freshwater fish. Examples, carp, pike. Ah, the Canadian put in with distinct scorn. You can keep the freshwater fish. Tertio, Conseil said, the sobrakins, whose pelvic fins are attached under the pectorals and hang directly from the shoulder bone. This order contains four families. Examples, flatfish, such as sole, turbot, dab, place, brill, and so forth. Excellent, really excellent, the harpooner exclaimed, interested in fish only from an edible viewpoint. Quarto, Conseil went on, unabashed. The apods, with long bodies that lack pelvic fins and are covered by a heavy, often glutinous skin, an order consisting of only one family. Examples? Common eels and electric eels. So-so. Just so-so, Ned Land replied. Quinto, Conseil said. The Lofobranchians, which have fully formed, free-moving jaws, but whose gills consist of little tufts arranged in pairs along the gill arches. This order includes only one family. Examples, seahorses and dragonfish. Bad, very bad, the harpooner replied. Sexto and last, Conseil said, the plectonaths, whose maxillary bone is firmly attached to the side of the intermaxillary that forms the jaw, and whose palate arch is locked to the skull by sutures that render the jaw immovable, an order lacking true pelvic fins, and which consists of two families. Examples, puffers and moonfish. They're an insult to a frying pan, the Canadian exclaimed. Are you grasping all this, Ned, my friend? asked the scholarly Conseil. Not a leg of it, Conseil, my friend, the harpooner replied. But keep going, because you fill me with fascination. As for cartilaginous fish, Conseil went on unflappably, they consist of only three orders. Good news, Ned put in. Primo, the cyclostomies, whose jaws are fused into a flexible ring and whose gill openings are simply a large number of holes, an order consisting of only one family. Example, the lamprey. An acquired taste, Ned Land replied. Secundo, the salacians, with gills resembling those of the cyclostomies, but whose lower jaw is free-moving. This order, which is the most important in the class, consists of two families. Examples, the ray and the shark. What? Ned Land exclaimed. Rays and man-eaters in the same order? Well, conceal my friend on behalf of the rays, I wouldn't advise you to put them in the same fish tank. Tertio, Conseil replied. The Sterionians, whose gill opening is the usual single slit adorned with a gill cover. An example consisting of four genera. Example, the sturgeon. Ah, conceal my friend, you saved the best for last, in my opinion, anyhow. And that's all of them? Yes, my gallant Ned, Conseil replied. And note well... Even when one has grasped all this, one still knows next to nothing, because these families are subdivided into genera, subgenera, species, varieties. All right, conceal, my friend, the harpooner said, leaning toward the glass panel. Here come a couple of your varieties now. Yes, fish, conceal exclaimed. One would think he was in front of an aquarium. No, I replied. "'because an aquarium is nothing more than a cage, "'and these fish are as free as birds in the air. "'Well, conceal, my friend, identify them. "'Start naming them,' Ned Land exclaimed. "'Me,' Conceal replied. 
I'm unable to. That's my employer's bailiwick. And in truth, although the fine lad was a classifying maniac, he was no naturalist, and I doubt that he could tell a bonito from a tuna. In short, he was the exact opposite of the Canadian, who knew nothing about classification, but could instantly put a name to any fish. A triggerfish, I said. It's a Chinese triggerfish, Ned Land replied. Genus ballistes, family, scleroderma, order, plectonatha, Conseil muttered. Assuredly, Ned and Conseil, in combination, added up to one outstanding naturalist. The Canadian was not mistaken. Cavorting around the Nautilus was a school of triggerfish with flat bodies, grainy skins, armed with stings on their dorsal fins, and with four prickly rows of quills covering on both sides of their tails. Nothing could have been more wonderful than the skin covering them, white underneath, gray above, with spots of gold sparkling in the dark eddies of the waves. Around them rays were undulating like sheets flapping in the wind, and among these I spotted, much to my glee, a Chinese ray, yellowish on its top side, a dainty pink on its belly, and armed with three stings behind its eyes, a rare species whose very existence was still doubted in Lacepede's day, since that pioneering classifier of fish had seen one only in a portfolio of Japanese drawings. For two hours a whole aquatic army escorted the Nautilus, in the midst of their leaping and cavorting, while they competed with each other in beauty, radiance, and speed, I could distinguish some green wrasse, bewhiskered mullet, marked with pairs of black lines, white gobies from the genus Eleotris, with curved caudal fins and violet spots on the back, wonderful Japanese mackerel from the genus Comba, with blue bodies and silver heads, glittering azure goldfish whose name by itself gives their full description, several varieties of porgy or gilthead, some banded gilthead with fins variously blue and yellow, some with horizontal heraldic bars and enhanced by a black strip around their caudal area, some with color zones and elegantly corseted in their six waistbands, trumpet fish with flute-like beaks that looked like genuine seafaring woodcocks and were sometimes a meter long, Japanese salamanders, serpentine moray eels from the genus Echidna that were six feet long with sharp little eyes and a huge mouth bristling with teeth and so forth. Our wonderment stayed at an all-time fever pitch. Our exclamations were endless. Ned identified the fish, Conseil classified them, and as for me, I was in ecstasy over the verve of their movements and the beauty of their forms. Never before had I been given the chance to glimpse these animals alive and at large in their native element. Given such a complete collection from the seas of Japan and China, I won't mention every variety that passed before our dazzled eyes. More numerous than birds in the air, these fish raced right up to us, no doubt attracted by the brilliant glow of our electric beacon. Suddenly, daylight appeared in the lounge. The sheet-iron panels slid shut. The magical vision disappeared. But for a good while I kept dreaming away, until the moment my eyes focused on the instruments hanging on the wall. The compass still showed our heading as east-northeast. The pressure gauge indicated a pressure of five atmospheres, corresponding to a depth of fifty meters, and the electric log gave our speed as fifteen miles per hour. I waited for Captain Nemo, but he didn't appear. The clock marked the hour of five. Ned Land and Conseil returned to their cabin. As for me, I repaired to my stateroom. There I found dinner ready for me. It consisted of turtle soup, made from the daintiest hawksbill, a red mullet with white, slightly flaky flesh, whose liver, when separately prepared, makes delicious eating, plus loin of imperial angelfish, whose flavor struck me as even better than salmon. I spent the evening in reading, writing, and thinking. Then drowsiness overtook me. I stretched out on my eelgrass mattress, and I fell into a deep slumber, while the Nautilus, glided through the swiftly flowing black current. Part 1, Chapter 15, An Invitation in Writing The next day, November 9th, I woke up only after a long, twelve-hour slumber. Conseil, a creature of habit, came to ask how Master's night went, and to offer his services. He had left his Canadian friend sleeping like a man who had never done anything else. I let the gallant lad babble as he pleased, without giving him much in the way of a reply. I was concerned about Captain Nemo's absence during our session the previous afternoon, and I hoped to see him again today. Soon I had put on my clothes, which were woven from strands of seashell tissue. More than once their composition provoked comments from Conseil. I informed him that they were made from the smooth, silken filaments with which the fan mussel, a type of seashell quite abundant along Mediterranean beaches, attaches itself to rocks. In olden times, 
Fine fabrics, stockings, and gloves were made from such filaments because they were both very soft and very warm. So the Nautilus's crew could dress themselves at little cost without needing a thing from cotton growers, sheep, or silkworms on shore. As soon as I was dressed, I made my way to the main lounge. It was deserted. I dove into studying the conchological treasures amassed inside the glass cases. I also investigated the huge plant albums that were filled with the rarest marine herbs, which, although they were pressed and dried, still kept their wonderful colors. Among these valuable water plants, I noted various seaweeds, some cladostephus, verticillitus, peacock's tails, fig-leafed colerpa, grain-bearing beauty bushes, delicate rose-tangle-tinted scarlet, sea colander arranged into fan shapes, mermaid's cups that looked like the caps of squat mushrooms, and for years had been classified among the zoophytes, in short, a complete series of algae. The entire day passed without my being honored by a visit from Captain Nemo. The panels in the lounge didn't open. Perhaps they didn't want us to get tired of these beautiful things. The Nautilus kept to an east-northeasterly heading, a speed of twelve miles per hour, and a depth between fifty and sixty meters. Next day, November 10th, the same neglect, the same solitude. I didn't see a soul from the crew. Ned and Conseil spent the better part of the day with me. They were astonished at the captain's inexplicable absence. Was this eccentric man ill? Did he want to change his plans concerning us? But, after all, as Conseil noted, we enjoyed complete freedom, we were daintily and abundantly fed, our host had kept to the terms of his agreement. We couldn't complain, and, moreover, the very uniqueness of our situation had such generous rewards in store for us we had no grounds for criticism. That day I started my diary of these adventures, which has enabled me to narrate them with the most scrupulous accuracy, and one odd detail— I wrote it on paper manufactured from marine eelgrass. Early in the morning on November 11th, fresh air poured through the Nautilus's interior, informing me that we had returned to the surface of the ocean to renew our oxygen supply. I headed for the central companionway and climbed onto the platform. It was six o'clock. I found the weather overcast, the sea gray but calm, hardly a billow. I hoped to encounter Captain Nemo there. Would he come? I saw only the helmsman imprisoned in his glass-windowed pilot-house. Seated on the ledge, furnished by the hull of the skiff, I inhaled the sea's salty aroma with great pleasure. Little by little, the mists were dispersed under the action of the sun's rays. The radiant orb cleared the eastern horizon. Under its gaze, the sea caught on fire like a trail of gunpowder. Scattered on high, the clouds were colored in bright, wonderfully shaded hues, and numerous lady-fingers warned of day-long winds. But... What were mere winds to this Nautilus which no storms could intimidate? So I was marveling at this delightful sunrise, so life-giving and cheerful, when I heard someone climbing onto the platform. I was prepared to greet Captain Nemo, but it was his chief officer who appeared, whom I had already met during our first visit with the captain. He advanced over the platform, not seeming to notice my presence. A powerful spyglass to his eye, he scrutinized every point of the horizon with the utmost care. Then, his examination over, he approached the hatch and pronounced a phrase whose exact wording follows below. I remember it because every morning it was repeated under the same circumstances. It ran like this. Natron respok lonifach. What it meant I was unable to say. These words pronounced, the chief officer went below again. I thought the Nautilus was about to resume its underwater navigating. So, I went down the hatch and back through the gangways to my stateroom. Five days passed in this way with no change in our situation. Every morning I climbed onto the platform. The same phrase was pronounced by the same individual. Captain Nemo did not appear. I was pursuing the policy that we had seen the last of him when on November 16th, while re-entering my stateroom with Ned and Conseil, I found a note addressed to me on the table. I opened it impatiently. It was written in a script that was clear and neat, but a bit old English in style, its characters reminding me of my German calligraphy. The note was worded as follows. Professor Aranax, aboard the Nautilus, November 16th, 1867. Captain Nemo invites Professor Aranax on a hunting trip that will take place tomorrow morning in his Crespo Island forests. He hopes nothing will prevent the professor from attending, and he looks forward with pleasure to the professor's companions joining him. Captain Nemo, commander of the Nautilus. A hunting trip? Ned exclaimed. 
and in his forest on Crespo Island, Conseil added. But does this mean the old boy goes ashore? Ned Land went on. That seems to be the gist of it, I said, rereading the letter. Well, we've got to accept, the Canadian answered. Once we're on solid ground, we'll figure out a course of action. Besides, it wouldn't pain me to eat a couple of slices of fresh venison. Without trying to reconcile the contradictions between Captain Nemo's professed horror of continents or islands and his invitation to go hunting in a forest, I was content to reply, First, let's look into this Crespo's Island. I consulted the world map, and in latitude 32 degrees, 40 minutes north, and longitude 167 degrees, 50 minutes west, I found an islet that had been discovered in 1801 by Captain Crespo, which old Spanish charts called Roca de la Plata, in other words, Silver Rock. So, we were about 1,800 miles from our starting point, and by a slight change of heading the Nautilus was bringing us back toward the southeast. I showed my companions this small stray rock in the middle of the North Pacific. "'If Captain Nemo does sometimes go ashore,' I told them, "'at least he only picks desert islands.' Ned Land shook his head without replying. Then he and Conseil left me. After supper was served me by the mute and emotionless steward, I fell asleep, but not without some anxieties. When I awoke the next day, November 17th, I sensed that the Nautilus was completely motionless. I dressed hurriedly and entered the main lounge. Captain Nemo was there waiting for me. He stood up, bowed, and asked if it suited me to come along. Since he made no allusion to his absence the past eight days, I also refrained from mentioning it, and I simply answered that my companions and I were ready to go with him. "'Only, sir,' I added, "'I'll take the liberty of addressing a question to you.' "'Address away, Professor Aranax, and if I am able to answer, I will.' "'Well, then, Captain, how is it that you've severed all ties with the shore, yet you own forests on Crespo Island?' "'Professor!' "'The captain answered me. "'These forests of mine don't bask in the heat and light of the sun. "'They aren't frequented by lions, tigers, panthers, or other quadrupeds. "'They're known only to me. "'They grow only for me. "'These forests aren't on land. "'They're actual underwater forests.' "'Underwater forests?' I exclaimed. "'Yes, Professor. "'And you're offering to take me to them?' "'Precisely.' "'On foot?' "'Without getting your feet wet. "'While hunting? "'While hunting. "'Rifles in hand? "'Rifles in hand.' "'I stared at the Nautilus's commander "'with an air anything but flattering to the man. "'Assuredly,' I said to myself, "'he's contracted some mental illness. "'He's had a fit that's lasted eight days "'and isn't over even yet. "'What a shame! "'I liked him better eccentric than insane.' "'These thoughts were clearly readable on my face.' but Captain Nemo remained content with inviting me to join him, and I did so like a man resigned to the worst. We arrived at the dining-room where we found breakfast served. "'Professor Aranex,' the captain told me, "'I beg you to share my breakfast without formality. We can chat while we eat, because, although I promised you a stroll in my forests, I made no pledge to arrange for your encountering a restaurant there. Accordingly, eat your breakfast like a man who probably eat dinner only when it's extremely late.' I did justice to this meal. It was made up of various fish and some slices of sea cucumber, that praiseworthy zoophyte, all garnished with such highly appetizing seaweed as the Periphera Lacentiata and the Laurentia Prima Fetida. Our beverage consisted of clear water, to which, following the captain's example, I added some drops of a fermented liquor extracted by the Kamchatka process from the seaweed known by name as Rhodomenia palmata. At first Captain Nemo ate without pronouncing a single word. Then he told me, "'Professor, when I proposed that you go hunting in my Crespo forests, you thought I was contradicting myself. When I informed you that it was an issue of underwater forests, you thought I'd gone insane. Professor, you must never make snap judgments about your fellow man. But, Captain, believe me, kindly listen to me, and you'll see if you have grounds for accusing me of insanity or self-contradiction.' I'm all attention. Professor, you know as well as I do that a man can live underwater so long as he carries with him his own supply of breathable air. For underwater work projects, 
the workman wears a waterproof suit with his head imprisoned in a metal capsule while he receives air from above by means of force pumps and flow regulators. That's the standard equipment for a diving suit, I said. Correct. But under such conditions, the man has no freedom. He's attached to a pump that sends him air through an India rubber hose. It's an actual chain that fetters him to the shore, and if we were to be bound in this way to the Nautilus, we couldn't go far either. Then how do you break free? I asked. We use the Rockway Roldenaru's device, invented by two of your fellow countrymen, but refined by me for my own special uses, thereby enabling you to risk these new physiological conditions without suffering any organic disorders. It consists of a tank built from heavy sheet iron in which I store air under a pressure of fifty atmospheres. This tank is fastened to the back by means of straps, like a soldier's knapsack. Its top part forms a box where the air is regulated by a bellows mechanism and can be released only at its proper tension. In the Roque Roll device that has been in general use, two India rubber hoses leave this box and feed to a kind of tent that imprisons the operator's nose and mouth. One hose is for the entrance of air to be inhaled, the other for the exit of air to be exhaled. And the tongue closes off the former or the latter, depending on the breather's needs. But in my case, since I face considerable pressures at the bottom of the sea, I needed to enclose my head in a copper sphere, like those found on standard diving suits, and the two hoses for inhalation and exhalation now feed to that sphere. That's perfect, Captain Nemo, but the air you carry must be quickly depleted, and once it contains no more than fifteen percent oxygen, it becomes unfit for breathing. Surely. But as I told you, Professor Aronnax, the Nautilus's pumps enable me to store air under considerable pressure, and given this circumstance, the tank on my diving equipment can supply breathable air for nine or ten hours. I have no more objections to raise, I replied. I'll only ask you, Captain, how can you light your way at the bottom of the ocean? With the Rimkorf device, Professor Aronnax, if the first is carried on the back, the second is fastened to the belt. It consists of a Bunsen battery that I activate not with potassium dichromate, but with sodium. An induction coil gathers the electricity generated and directs it to a specially designed lantern. In this lantern, one finds a glass spiral that contains only a residue of carbon dioxide gas. When the device is operating, this gas becomes luminous and gives off a continuous whitish light. Thus provided for, I breathe and I see. Captain Nemo. To my every objection you've given such crushing answers, I'm afraid to entertain a single doubt. However, though, I have no choice but to accept both the Roqueyrol and Rumkorf devices. I'd like to register some reservations about the rifle with which you'll equip me. But it isn't a rifle that uses gunpowder, the captain replied. Then it's an air gun? Surely. How can I make gunpowder on my ship when I have no saltpeter, sulfur, or charcoal? Even so... I replied. To fire under water in a medium that's 855 times denser than air, you'd have to overcome considerable resistance. That doesn't necessarily follow. There are certain Fulton-style guns perfected by the Englishman Phillips Coles and Burley, the Frenchman Fursey, and the Italian Landi. They're equipped with a special system of airtight fastenings and can fire in underwater conditions. But I repeat, having no gunpowder... I've replaced it with air at high pressure, which is abundantly supplied me by the Nautilus's pumps. But this air must be swiftly depleted. Well, in a pinch, can't my Roqueyrol tank supply me with more? All I have to do is draw it from an ad hoc spigot. Besides, Professor Aronnax, you'll see for yourself that during these underwater hunting trips we make no great expenditure of either air or bullets. But it seems to me that... In this semi-darkness, amid this liquid that's so dense in comparison to the atmosphere, a gunshot wouldn't carry far and would prove fatal only with difficulty. On the contrary, sir. With this rifle, every shot is fatal, and as soon as the animal is hit, no matter how lightly, it falls as if struck by lightning. Why? Because this rifle doesn't shoot ordinary bullets, but little glass capsules invented by the Austrian chemist Lenbrook, and I have a considerable supply of them. These glass capsules are covered with a strip of steel and weighted with a lead base. They're genuine little laden jars charged with high-voltage electricity. They go off at the slightest impact, and the animal, no matter how strong, drops dead. I might add that these capsules are no bigger than number four shot, and the chamber of any ordinary rifle could hold ten of them. I'll quit debating, I replied, 
getting up from the table. And all that's left is for me to shoulder my rifle, so where you go, I'll go. Captain Nemo led me to the Nautilus's stern, and passing by Ned in Conseil's cabin, I summoned my two companions, who instantly followed us. Then we arrived at a cell located within easy access of the engine room. In this cell we were to get dressed for our stroll. Part 1, Chapter 16, Strolling the Plains This cell, properly speaking, was the Nautilus's arsenal and wardrobe. Hanging from its walls, a dozen diving outfits were waiting for anybody who wanted to take a stroll. After seeing these, Ned Land exhibited an obvious distaste for the idea of putting one on. "'But my gallant Ned,' I told him, "'the forests of Crespo Island are simply underwater forests.' "'Oh, great,' put in the disappointed harpooner, watching his dreams of fresh meat fade away. "'And you, Professor Aronnax, are you going to stick yourself inside these clothes?' "'It has to be, Mr. Ned.' "'Have it your way, sir,' the harpooner replied, shrugging his shoulders. "'But speaking for myself, I'll never get into those things unless they force me.' "'No one will force you, Mr. Land,' Captain Nemo said. "'And is Conseil going to risk it?' Ned asked. "'Where Master goes, I go,' Conseil replied. At the captain's summons, two crewmen came to help us put on these heavy waterproof clothes— made from seamless India rubber, and expressly designed to bear considerable pressures. They were like suits of armor that were both yielding and resistant, you might say. These clothes consisted of jacket and pants. The pants ended in bulky footwear adorned with heavy lead soles. The fabric of the jacket was reinforced with copper mail that shielded the chest, protected it from the underwater pressure, and allowed the lungs to function freely. The sleeves ended in supple gloves that didn't impede hand movements. These perfected diving suits, it was easy to see, were a far cry from such misshapen costumes as the cork breastplates, leather jumpers, sea-going tunics, barrel helmets, etc., invented and acclaimed in the eighteenth century. Conseil and I were soon dressed in these diving suits, as were Captain Nemo and one of his companions, a Herculean type who must have been prodigiously strong. All that remained was to encase one's head in its metal sphere— but before proceeding with this operation, I asked the captain for permission to examine the rifles set aside for us. One of the Nautilus's men presented me with a streamlined rifle whose butt was boilerplate steel, hollow inside, and of fairly large dimensions. This served as a tank for the compressed air, which a trigger-operated valve could release into the metal chamber. In a groove where the butt was heaviest, a cartridge clip held some twenty electric bullets that, by means of a spring, automatically took their places in the barrel of the rifle— as soon as one shot had been fired, another was ready to go off. "'Captain Nemo,' I said, "'this is an ideal easy-to-use weapon. I ask only to put it to the test. But how will we reach the bottom of the sea?' "'Right now, Professor, the Nautilus is aground in ten meters of water, and we've only to depart. But how will we set out? You'll see.' Captain Nemo inserted his cranium into its spherical headgear. Conseil and I did the same.' but not without hearing the Canadian toss us a sarcastic, "'Happy hunting!' On top, the suit ended in a collar of threaded copper, into which the metal helmet was screwed. Three holes, protected by heavy glass, allowed us to see in any direction with a simple turn of the head inside the sphere. Placed on our backs, the Roqueiral device went into operation as soon as it was in position, and for my part, I could breathe with ease. The Ruhmkorff lamp, hanging from my belt, my rifle in hand, I was ready to go forth. But in all honesty, while imprisoned in these heavy clothes and nailed to the deck by my lead soles, it was impossible for me to take a single step. But this circumstance had been foreseen, because I felt myself propelled into a little room adjoining the wardrobe. Towed in the same way, my companions went with me. I heard a door with watertight seals close after us, and we were surrounded by profound darkness. After some minutes, a sharp hissing reached my ears. I felt a distinct sensation of cold rising from my feet to my chest. Apparently, a stopcock inside the boat was letting in water from outside, which overran us, and soon filled up the room. Contrived in the Nautilus's side, a second door then opened. We were lit by a subdued light. An instant later, our feet were treading the bottom of the sea. And now, how can I convey the impressions left on me by this stroll under the waters? Words are powerless to describe such wonders. When even the painter's brush can't depict the effects unique to the liquid element, how can the writer's pen hope to reproduce them? Captain Nemo walked in front, and his companion followed us a few steps to the rear. 
Conseil and I stayed next to each other, as if daydreaming that, through our metal carapaces, a little polite conversation might still be possible. Already I no longer felt the bulkiness of my clothes, footwear, and air tank, nor the weight of the heavy sphere inside which my head was rattling like an almond in its shell. Once immersed in water, all these objects lost a part of their weight equal to the weight of the liquid they displaced, and thanks to this law of physics discovered by Archimedes, I did just fine. I was no longer an inert mass, and I had, comparatively speaking, great freedom of movement. Lighting up the seafloor even thirty feet beneath the surface of the ocean, the sun astonished me with its power. The solar rays easily crossed this aqueous mass and dispersed its dark colors. I could easily distinguish objects one hundred meters away. Farther on, the bottom was tinted with fine shades of ultramarine. Then, off in the distance, it turned blue and faded in the midst of a hazy darkness. Truly, this water surrounding me was just a kind of air, denser than the atmosphere on land, but almost as transparent. Above me, I could see the calm surface of the ocean. We were walking on sand that was fine, grained, and smooth, not wrinkled like beach sand, which preserves the impressions left by the waves. This dazzling carpet was a real mirror, throwing back the sun's rays with startling intensity. The outcome? An immense vista of reflections that penetrated every liquid molecule. Will anyone believe me if I assert that at this thirty-foot depth I could see as if it was broad daylight? For a quarter of an hour I trod this blazing sand, which was strewn with tiny crumbs of seashell. Looming like a long reef, the Nautilus's hull disappeared little by little, but when night fell in the midst of the waters, the ship's beacon would surely facilitate our return on board, since its rays carried with perfect distinctness. This effect is difficult to understand for anyone who has never seen light beams so sharply defined on shore. There the dust that saturates the air gives such rays the appearance of a luminous fog. But above the water, as well as underwater, shafts of electric light are transmitted with incomparable clarity. Meanwhile we went ever onward, and these vast plains of sand seemed endless. My hands parted liquid curtains that closed again behind me, and my footprints faded swiftly under the water's pressure. Soon, scarcely blurred by their distance from us, the forms of some objects took shape before my eyes. I recognized the lower slopes of some magnificent rocks, carpeted by the finest zoophyte specimens, and right off I was struck by an effect unique to this medium. By then it was ten o'clock in the morning. The sun's rays hit the surface of the waves at a fairly oblique angle, decomposing by refraction as though passing through a prism, and when this light came in contact with flowers, rocks, buds, seashells, and polyps, the edges of these objects were shaded with all seven hues of the solar spectrum. This riot of rainbow tints was a wonder, a feast for the eyes, a genuine kaleidoscope of red, green, yellow, orange, violet, indigo, and blue, in short, the whole palette of a color-happy painter. If only I had been able to share with Conseil the intense sensations rising in my brain, competing with him in exclamations of wonderment. If only I had known, like Captain Nemo and his companion, how to exchange thoughts by means of prearranged signals. So, for lack of anything better, I talked to myself. I declaimed inside this copper box that topped my head, spending more air on empty words than was perhaps advisable. Conseil, like me, had stopped before this splendid sight. Obviously, in the presence of these zoophyte and mollusk specimens, the fine lad was classifying his head off. Polyps and echinoderms abounded on the seafloor, various isis coral, conularian coral living in isolation, tufts of virginal genus oculina, formerly known by the name white coral, prickly fungus coral in the shape of mushrooms, sea anemone holding on by their muscular discs, providing a literal flower-bed adorned by jellyfish from the genus Porpita, wearing collars of azure tentacles, and starfish that spangled the sand, including vein-like feather stars from the genus Asterophyton that were like fine lace embroidered by the hands of water-nymphs, their festoons swaying to the faint undulations caused by our walking." It filled me with real chagrin to crush underfoot the gleaming mollusk samples that littered the seafloor by the thousands, concentric comb shells, hammer shells, coquina, seashells that actually hop around, top shell snails, red helmet shells, angel wing conchs, sea hares, and so many other exhibits from this inexhaustible ocean. But we had to keep walking, and we went forward while overhead there scudded schools of Portuguese men of war that let their ultramarine tentacles drift in their wakes. Medusas whose milky white or dainty pink parasols were festooned with azure tassels and shaded us from the sun's rays, 
plus jellyfish of the species Pelagia panopera that, in the dark, would have strewn our path with phosphorescent glimmers. All these wonders I glimpsed in the space of a quarter of a mile, barely pausing, following Captain Nemo, whose gestures kept beckoning me onward. Soon the nature of the seafloor changed. The plains of sand were followed by a bit of that viscous slime Americans call ooze, which is composed exclusively of seashells rich in limestone or silica. Then we crossed a prairie of algae, open sea plants that the waters hadn't yet torn loose, whose vegetation grew in wild profusion. Soft to the foot, these densely textured lawns would have rivaled the most luxuriant carpets woven by the hand of man. But while this greenery was sprawling under our steps, it didn't neglect us overhead. The surface of the water was crisscrossed by a floating arbor of marine plants belonging to that superabundant algae family that numbers more than two thousand known species. I saw long ribbons of fucus drifting above me, some globular, others tubular. Laurentia cladustephus, with the slenderest foliage. Rhodomenia palmata, resembling the fan shapes of cactus. I observed that green-colored plants kept closer to the surface of the sea, while reds occupied a medium depth, which left blacks and browns in charge of designing gardens and flower beds in the ocean's lower strata. These algae are a genuine prodigy of creation, one of the wonders of world flora. This family produces both the biggest and smallest vegetables in the world, because, just as forty thousand near-invisible buds have been counted in one five-square-millimeter space, so also have fucus plants been gathered that were over five hundred meters long. We had been gone from the Nautilus for about an hour and a half. It was almost noon. I spotted this fact in the perpendicularity of the sun's rays, which were no longer refracted. The magic of these solar colors disappeared little by little, with emerald and sapphire shades vanishing from our surroundings altogether. We walked with steady steps that rang on the seafloor with astonishing intensity. The tiniest sounds were transmitted with a speed to which the ear is unaccustomed on shore. In fact, water is a better conductor of sound than air, and under the waves noises carry four times as fast. Just then, the seafloor began to slope sharply downward. The light took on a uniform hue. We reached a depth of one hundred meters, by which point we were undergoing a pressure of ten atmospheres. But my diving clothes were built along such lines that I never suffered from this pressure— I felt only a certain tightness in the joints of my fingers, and even this discomfort soon disappeared. As for the exhaustion bound to accompany a two-hour stroll in such unfamiliar trappings, it was nil. Helped by the water, my movements were executed with startling ease. Arriving at this three-hundred-foot depth, I still detected the sun's rays, but just barely. Their intense brilliance had been followed by a reddish twilight, a midpoint between night and day. But we could see well enough to find our way— and it still wasn't necessary to activate the Ruhmkorff device. Just then, Captain Nemo stopped. He waited until I joined him. Then he pointed a finger at some dark masses outlined in the shadows a short distance away. It's the forests of Crespo Island, I thought, and I was not mistaken. Part 1, Chapter 17 An Underwater Forest we had finally arrived on the outskirts of this forest, surely one of the finest in Captain Nemo's immense domains. He regarded it as his own, and had laid the same claim to it that, in the first days of the world, the first men had to their forests on land. Besides, who else could dispute his ownership of this underwater property? What other bolder pioneer would come, axe in hand, to clear away its dark underbrush? This forest was made up of big tree-like plants— and when we entered beneath their huge arches, my eyes were instantly struck by the unique arrangement of their branches, an arrangement that I had never before encountered. None of the weeds carpeting the seafloor, none of the branches bristling from the shrubbery, crept, or leaned, or stretched on a horizontal plane. They all rose straight up toward the surface of the ocean. Every filament or ribbon, no matter how thin, stood ramrod straight. Fucus plants and creepers were growing in stiff perpendicular lines governed by the density of the element that generated them. After I parted them with my hands, these otherwise motionless plants would shoot straight back to their original positions. It was the regime of verticality. I soon grew accustomed to this bizarre arrangement, likewise to the comparative darkness surrounding us. The seafloor in this forest was strewn with sharp chunks of stone that were hard to avoid. Here the range of underwater flora seemed pretty comprehensive to me, as well as more abundant than it might have been in the Arctic or tropical zones, where such exhibits are less common. 
but for a few minutes I kept accidentally confusing the two kingdoms, mistaking zoophytes for water plants, animals for vegetables, and who hasn't made the same blunder? Flora and fauna are so closely associated in the underwater world. I observed that all these exhibits from the vegetable kingdom were attached to the seafloor by only the most makeshift methods. They had no roots and didn't care which solid objects secured them, sand, shells, husks, or pebbles. They didn't ask their hosts for sustenance, just a point of purchase. These plants are entirely self-propagating, and the principle of their existence lies in the water that sustains and nourishes them. In place of leaves, most of them sprouted blades of unpredictable shape, which were confined to a narrow gamut of colors consisting only of pink, crimson, green, olive, tan, and brown. There I saw again, but not yet pressed and dried, like the Nautilus's specimens, some peacock's tails spread open like fans to stir up a cooling breeze, scarlet rose tangle, sea tangle stretching out their young and edible shoots, twisting strings of kelp from the genus Nerocytus that bloomed to a height of fifteen meters, bouquets of mermaid's cups whose stems grew wider at the top, and a number of other open sea plants, all without flowers. It's an odd anomaly in this bizarre element, as one witty naturalist puts it. The animal kingdom blossoms, and the vegetable kingdom doesn't. These various types of shrubbery were as big as trees in the temperate zones. In the damp shade between them, there were clustered actual bushes of moving flowers, hedges of zoophytes in which there grew stony coral striped with twisting furrows, yellowish sea anemone from the genus Caryophilia with translucent tentacles, plus anemone with grassy tufts from the genus Zoantharia, and to complete the illusion, minnows flitted from branch to branch like a swarm of hummingbirds, while there arose underfoot, like a covey of snipe, yellow fish from the genus Lepisocanthus, with bristling jaws and sharp scales, flying gurnards and pinecone fish. Near one o'clock, Captain Nemo gave the signal to halt. Speaking for myself, I was glad to oblige, and we stretched out beneath an arbor of winged kelp, whose long, thin tendrils stood up like arrows. This short break was a delight. It lacked only the charm of conversation, but it was impossible to speak, impossible to reply. I simply nudged my big copper headpiece against Conseil's headpiece. I saw a happy gleam in the gallant lad's eyes, and to communicate his pleasure, he jiggled around inside his carapace in the world's silliest way. After four hours of strolling, I was quite astonished not to feel any intense hunger. What kept my stomach in such a good mood, I'm unable to say. But in exchange, I experienced that irresistible desire for sleep that comes over every diver. Accordingly, my eyes soon closed behind their heavy glass windows, and I fell into an uncontrollable doze, which until then I had been able to fight off only through the movements of our walking. Captain Nemo and his muscular companion were already stretched out in this clear crystal, setting us a fine naptime example. How long I was sunk in this torpor I cannot estimate. But when I awoke, it seemed as if the sun were settling toward the horizon. Captain Nemo was already up, and I had started to stretch my limbs when an unexpected apparition brought me sharply to my feet. A few paces away, a monstrous meter-high sea spider was staring at me with beady eyes, poised to spring at me. Although my diving suit was heavy enough to protect me from this animal's bites, I couldn't keep back a shudder of horror. Just then Conseil woke up, together with the Nautilus's sailor. Captain Nemo alerted his companion to this hideous crustacean, which a swing of the rifle butt quickly brought down, and I watched the monster's horrible legs writhing in dreadful convulsions. This encounter reminded me that other more daunting animals must be lurking in these dark reaches, and my diving suit might not be adequate protection against their attacks. Such thoughts hadn't previously crossed my mind, and I was determined to keep on my guard. Meanwhile, I had assumed this rest period would be the turning point in our stroll, but I was mistaken, and instead of heading back to the Nautilus, Captain Nemo continued his daring excursion. The seafloor kept sinking, and its significantly steeper slope took us to greater depths. It must have been nearly three o'clock when we reached a narrow valley gouged between high vertical walls and located one hundred and fifty meters down. Thanks to the perfection of our equipment, we had thus gone ninety meters below the limit that nature had until then set on man's underwater excursions. I say one hundred and fifty meters, although I had no instruments for estimating this distance. But I knew that the sun's rays, even in the clearest seas, could reach no deeper. So at precisely this point, the darkness became profound. Not a single object was visible past ten paces. Consequently, 
I had begun to grope my way when suddenly I saw the glow of an intense white light. Captain Nemo had just activated his electric device. His companion did likewise. Conseil and I followed suit. By turning a switch, I established contact between the induction coil and the glass spiral, and the sea lit up by our four lanterns was illuminated for a radius of twenty-five meters. Captain Nemo continued to plummet into the dark depths of this forest, whose shrubbery grew ever more sparse. I observed that vegetable life was disappearing more quickly than animal life. The open-sea plants had already left behind the increasingly arid seafloor, where a prodigious number of animals were still swarming—zoophytes, articulates, mollusks, and fish. While we were walking, I thought the lights of our Rumkorf devices would automatically attract some inhabitants of these dark strata. But if they did approach us, at least they kept at a distance regrettable from the hunter's standpoint. Several times I saw Captain Nemo stop and take aim with his rifle— then, after sighting down its barrel for a few seconds, he would straighten up and resume his walk. Finally, at around four o'clock, this marvelous excursion came to an end. A wall of superb rocks stood before us, imposing in its sheer mass, a pile of gigantic stone blocks, an enormous granite cliffside pitted with dark caves, but not offering a single gradient we could climb up. This was the underpinning of Crespo Island. This was land. The captain stopped suddenly. A gesture from him brought us to a halt, and however much I wanted to clear this wall, I had to stop. Here ended the domains of Captain Nemo. He had no desire to pass beyond them. Farther on lay a part of the globe he would no longer tread underfoot. Our return journey began. Captain Nemo resumed the lead in our little band, always heading forward without hesitation. I noted that we didn't follow the same path in returning to the Nautilus. This new route, very steep, and hence very arduous, quickly took us close to the surface of the sea. But this return to the upper strata wasn't so sudden that decompression took place too quickly, which could have led to serious organic disorders and given us those internal injuries so fatal to divers. With great promptness, the light reappeared and grew stronger, and the refraction of the sun, already low on the horizon, again ringed the edges of various objects with the entire color spectrum. At a depth of ten meters, we walked amid a swarm of small fish from every species, more numerous than birds in the air, more agile, too, but no aquatic game worthy of a gunshot had yet been offered to our eyes. Just then, I saw the captain's weapon spring to his shoulder and track a moving object through the bushes. A shot went off, I heard a faint hissing, and an animal dropped a few paces away, literally struck by lightning. It was a magnificent sea otter from the genus Enhydra the only exclusively marine quadruped. One and a half meters long, this otter had to be worth a good high price. Its coat, chestnut brown above and silver below, would have made one of those wonderful fur pieces so much in demand in the Russian and Chinese markets. The fineness and luster of its pelt guaranteed that it would go for at least two thousand francs. I was full of wonderment at this unusual mammal, with its circular head adorned by short ears, its round eyes, its white whiskers like those on a cat, its webbed and clawed feet, its bushy tail. Hunted and trapped by fishermen, this valuable carnivore has become extremely rare, and it takes refuge chiefly in the northernmost parts of the Pacific, where in all likelihood its species will soon be facing extinction. Captain Nemo's companion picked up the animal, loaded it on his shoulder, and we took to the trail again. For an hour plains of sand unrolled before our steps. Often the seafloor rose to within two meters of the surface of the water. I could then see our images clearly mirrored on the underside of the waves, but reflected upside down. Above us there appeared an identical band that duplicated our every movement and gesture. In short, a perfect likeness of the quartet near which it walked, but with heads down and feet in the air. Another unusual effect. Heavy clouds passed above us, forming and fading swiftly. But after thinking it over, I realized that these so-called clouds were caused simply by the changing densities of the long ground swells, and I even spotted the foaming whitecaps that their breaking crests were proliferating over the surface of the water. Lastly, I couldn't help seeing the actual shadows of large birds passing over our heads, swiftly skimming the surface of the sea. On this occasion I witnessed one of the finest gunshots ever to thrill the marrow of a hunter. A large bird with a wide wingspan, quite clearly visible, approached and hovered above us. When it was just a few meters above the waves, Captain Nemo's companion took aim and fired. The animal dropped, 
electrocuted, and its descent brought it within reach of our adroit hunter, who promptly took possession of it. It was an albatross of the finest species, a wonderful specimen of these open-sea fowl. This incident did not interrupt our walk. For two hours we were sometimes led over plains of sand, sometimes over prairies of seaweed that were quite arduous to cross. In all honesty, I was dead tired by the time I spotted a hazy glow half a mile away, cutting through the darkness of the waters. It was the Nautilus's beacon. Within twenty minutes we would be on board again, and there I could breathe easy again, because my tank's current air supply seemed to be quite low in oxygen. But I was reckoning without an encounter that slightly delayed our arrival. I was lagging behind some twenty paces when I saw Captain Nemo suddenly come back toward me. With his powerful hands he sent me buckling to the ground, while his companion did the same to Conseil. At first I didn't know what to make of this sudden assault, but I was reassured to observe the captain lying motionless beside me. I was stretched out on the seafloor, directly beneath some bushes of algae, when I raised my head and spied two enormous masses hurtling by, throwing off phosphorescent glimmers. My blood turned cold in my veins. I saw that we were under threat from a fearsome pair of sharks. They were blue sharks, dreadful man-eaters, with enormous tails, dull, glassy stares, and phosphorescent matter oozing from holes around their snouts. They were like monstrous fireflies that could thoroughly pulverize a man in their iron jaws. I don't know if Conseil was busy with their classification, but as for me, I looked at their silver bellies, their fearsome mouths bristling with teeth from a viewpoint less than scientific, more as a victim than as a professor of natural history. Luckily, these voracious animals have poor eyesight. They went by without noticing us, grazing us with their brownish fins, and miraculously we escaped a danger greater than encountering a tiger deep in the jungle. Half an hour later, guided by its electric trail, we reached the Nautilus. The outside door had been left open, and Captain Nemo closed it after we re-entered the first cell. Then he pressed a button. I heard pumps operating within the ship. I felt the water lowering around me and in a few moments the cell was completely empty. The inside door opened, and we passed into the wardrobe. There our diving suits were removed, not without difficulty, and, utterly exhausted, faint from lack of food and rest, I repaired to my stateroom, full of wonder at this startling excursion on the bottom of the sea. The End of Part 1, Chapter 17 Of Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne Read by Rick Kishner for Lip to Go on the Web at fcit.usf.edu.